Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, we're going to get today's uh, council meeting started, Tuesday, April 20th, and we'll just ask that the mayor call the meeting to order. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. I'd like to welcome everyone to the meeting today, Tuesday, April the 20th. Uh, first order of business is what we typically do, the singing of O Canada. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read a little bio, and then uh, our staff are going to play a pre-recorded performance. And, uh, and if you like, you can stand to the O Canada singing. <clears throat> so today's O Canada performance is sung by Emily and Alana Kapatanchuk. Emily and Alana are sisters. They're eight and nine years old. They're in grades three and four at Prince Philip in French immersion. They both love dance and singing. Alana also does cheerleading. Emily enjoys hockey and art. Please welcome Emily and Alana singing O Canada. girls, Emily and Alana Kapitanchuk. Fantastic job. Uh, really impressed. You've got real talent and it's really nice to Sisters Harmony singing together. So on behalf of the City of Niagara Falls and all the City Council, we want to say thank you for singing O Canada and thank you for doing such a great job. We're really proud of you. Thank you. All right, next order of business is the adoption of the minutes from our March 23rd meeting. Uh, Councillor Thompson is making the motion, seconded by Councillor Cario. Is there any discussions to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Okay, and that is Councillor Inoni, are you in favor of that too? Yep, okay, thank you. We're unanimous on that. All right, moving to disclosures of a pecuniary interest. Do we have any disclosures of counselor? Councillor Lococo, Peter Angelo. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I have two checks that were payable to myself for reimbursement of expenses. Check 444188, March 3rd, 2020 for $122.12. Check 444628, March 24th, 2020. For $127.77. And I have a conflict of interest on 7.7 .7 downtown BIA and 9.18 downtown BIA. Those are all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. We've got Councillor Peter Angelo and then Cario. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, PD 2021 18, dealing with the employment land strategy. Uh, my family has land in the Lions Creek, Montrose area, which looks to be in close proximity to some of the maps. And PBD 2021-13, this deals with uh, two properties at 6400 and 6420 Taylor Road. Um, my uh, family is involved in the ownership and as well, along with that application, there's a resolution and the resolution number is AM 2019-19. And lastly, Your Worship, it's a check made out to the Niagara Catholic District School Board, my employer, 
And that check number is 00331-0043. Thank you very much. Councilor Carrio. Thank you, Worship. CD 2021-01, a waiver of business licenses. I have one of the businesses that's mentioned. And then the consent agenda, uh, L202107, encroachment agreement by 6361 Fallsview Boulevard, my neighbor. Okay, thank you, Councillor Cario. Councillor Lococo. Sorry, Mr. Mayor, I think I'm going to declare a conflict of interest on 6.1, the employment lands. My family owns property out there as well. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, any other disclosures? Okay, seeing none, I've got three I'd like to disclose. Uh, two are checks to myself, checks number 4440038 and 444603, uh, and as well, one made out to a family member um, at 444436. And uh, we'll be sure uh, your de declarations that you get these over to the clerk. Uh, Mr. Clerk, just to remind me, um, obviously they can't physically hand them to you. Can they email them to you? Is that okay? Yes, Your Worship, uh, anything can be sent to me in writing and email would be sufficient. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much for that. All right, moving along. Oh, look at that. We're at the favorite part of the meeting. Mayor's announcements. This is a good bathroom break, Councilor Cario. Here's your chance. Okay, first off, uh, we had some birthdays uh, in the last little while. First, we had Councillor Dabrowski, whose birthday was March 31st. Happy birthday, Councillor Dabrowski. And Thank then you. our CAO, Ken Todd, his birthday was April the 12th. Happy birthday to Ken, the last birthday we're going to celebrate with you. And lastly, Councillor Iannone's birthday was April the 13th. So happy birthday, Councillor Iannone. Moving along on the other end, obituaries, um, Frank... Devereaux, the father of Frank Devereaux Jr., who was a captain of our fire prevention, uh, passed away. John James, retired platoon chief in fire services. Tommaso Mazzari, father of retired city employee Tom Mazzari. And William Matson, father of our city clerk, Bill Matson. So we offer our sympathy and our condolences to all the families for their love, their lost loved ones. Also, I know recently it was in the news, the passing of Prince Philip. So if you look to your screen, you'll see uh, we've got a picture of his last visit to Niagara Falls in 1951. And Heather, our clerk's department is showing this picture of the falls turned purple. So there's the picture. Okay, so there's that's the falls turned purple. And there, uh, there the prince was, what he looked like back in the day. And then she's also got a picture of him driving by the falls, which is pretty exciting. Looked a little different back then. Uh, along with the future queen. And there they are having a look and taking it all in. So pretty exciting to have the royalty right in our backyard. Uh, his long service to the Commonwealth has been recognized to the queen and to his country. We had flags at city hall and city buildings at half staff in his honor. And uh, we're just to, uh, proud that we could take part in the celebration of his life. Next up, um, Riker. Riker, uh, Riker Burbage, Burbage is a real remarkable young man from Niagara Falls, and that's him on the sidewalk. And I was presenting him with a Team Riker, or he presented me with a Team Riker shirt, and um, we gave him some city swag. That was him right after he left Sick Kids. He'd been in the hospital for the last year. Um, real crazy story. He, it was, it was one year being treated. Uh, his body uh, was scarred by 80% after a terrible accident that happened in the family yard. We'd like to thank our fire department for their help in welcome, welcoming him home and hanging a flag for him. Some of the staff came dressed and came to attend as first responders uh, at Riker's accident. And they were able to come as well and welcome him home. Uh, we'd like to thank Mr. Felino, former teacher and the staff at Cherrywood for organizing such a great event as they drove him with the fire truck past his school as he got to wave to all his friends. That's his first time coming back to the city. And I can tell you, he was just a ball of energy, so grateful and happy to be home. And uh, matter of fact, that day, uh, you'll notice in the picture I was wearing a Toronto Maple Leafs hat. And those of you will know I'm a Habs fan. 
And I said to him, I said, Riker, for you, I'm going to wear a, a, a Leafs hat. So it was hard. It still kind of made my head a little hot, but that's okay. I did it. And he's a good kid. And we're, we're proud of him and happy to have him home. He's, and, and also to acknowledge his great family. His mom just did, it was amazing what she did. And matter of fact, when he was on fire in the yard, what she did, like like any great mother would do, she jumped on top of him to smother the fire. And then she received third degree burns to a good portion of her body as well. But what an incredible family. And I was honored to be there on behalf of council. I welcome him back, back home. Now, the next one, I'm gonna give an introduction to this. This is a really, really interesting thing as well. Uh, I recently got to uh, visit Miss Edith McLeod on her front porch, and it was a real interesting story. So I had the honor of making a special historic presentation, and I'm sure you're going to read about this in the paper in the next little bit, and you're going to see a, a number of different things done on it. But Edith is a Niagara Falls resident. She lost her brother in World War II. She was in high school back then. I believe she was at Stanford, and he was working, working for a local bank, and he made the decision to go fight for Canada and to go fight uh, Hitler. And they didn't want him to go because he, apparently he was quite good at the bank, and, and, but he felt it was his duty to his country. Well, he, he just was on a, a flight back in a, in a British uh, airplane. They just finished bombing Germany. On the way back, they took some night fire and he ended up crashing in the Netherlands. And they recently, by accident, found the airplane all these years later from 1943. So the plane was resurrected and it's uh, recently the plane was re resurrected and the town there, the government made a decision. They created a bronze statue that's going to be erected there in honor of all the sacrifices of those that made during World War II. And there's a, a city by the name of Almere and the mayor of Almere reached out to me in the Netherlands and asked if we would make the presentation to Edith on their behalf. Edith is in her 90s, and she lives on O'Neill Street, and she asked, and there, that's a picture of Edith there, and it was really interesting hearing her story because she was just sharp as a tack, and, and you'll see um, in a second, we're going to play a video for you, but I, I, I asked her, and I also got to present her a couple of shards from the airplane, the plane that was shot down and that went in the lake right next to Almir, so we presented those to her. We presented a miniature of the big bronze that they're going to be unveiling. And the reason they asked me to do this for a few reasons, but the biggest ones were, number one, with COVID, they didn't know how soon. They're, they're planning to fly Edith over to the Netherlands to be there in person for the unveiling of the statue and for a big ceremony. But they understand they couldn't figure out the timing and with COVID and whatnot. So they wanted me in the meantime to do this until they're able to get her over there, as well as family of the other fighters that were shot down as well. So we've got a special presentation video and, and hopefully uh, you guys can listen in for, for a few minutes. All right, well, I'm here today with Edith, runner front porch, and it's a very, very special and unique day today. We've got a little presentation we're gonna do, but Edith, just before we do, I'd like to read a few notes to you if that's okay. Yes. So Edith, 94 years old and looks absolutely amazing on a beautiful April morning, a little bit chilly. So Edith, your brother. So Edith's brother was a flying officer in World War II, Harry Gregory Farrington. And on his way back after having bombed Berlin, yeah. on their way back flying over the Netherlands, their plane crashed. And well, him, it got, shot down. it got shot down by the Germans and then it crashed in the Netherlands. And uh, Eric, along with the other crewmen, all perished. And they just recently found the plane and they brought it up again. And the family, the people of the Netherlands, wanted us to come to you to present this to you until they do their formal ceremony later on in the, in the year, in the fall of this year. So the city is Elmere, Netherlands, where the plane crashed. And this was the RAF World War II bomber and it landed in Lake Markermere, Lake Markermere. So accidentally they found the plane and they spent the money to bring it back up. And what we've got is a beautiful gift for you, Edith. And this comes from the Netherlands. And it's a beautiful, beautiful box. And inside of the box is a replica 
and this is a replica of the bronze statue that is in the Netherlands and this is a gift for you from the government it's heavy and they also that you mentioned about the books they've also sent along a couple of books the Knight of the Sterling that is also included and there's something else there's another part in here and this is really really interesting and to chat it's in here yes it is this is a couple of pieces from the wreckage from the actual plane that was shot down in Vermeer and this is a piece of the aluminum from the body of your brother's airplane it's so incredibly special and historical and that was risen from Lake Markermere and of course from the town of Almere town of a couple of hundred thousand people and the vice mayor reached directly out to me and asked if I would do the ceremony on behalf of the people of the Netherlands mm -hmm. they're so grateful so I'd like to also read to you the certificate Edith on behalf of the members of City Council and the city of Niagara Falls we extend our deepest condolences to you Edith McLeod and to your family on the loss of your family member your brother flying officer Harry Gregory Farrington March 1943 near Elmere in the Netherlands and we're thankful for his sacrifice for our freedom may he rest in peace forever so today is very special as we show up for Edith to present her the replica to present her some parts of the airplane and some books and we want to thank the people of the Netherlands no I wanted to shake you oh <laughs> thank you thank you Edith. thank you very much well, if there's any message you want to say to the people of the Netherlands for doing such a wonderful thing, Edith. Well, I am the last member of our family, and Harry and I were very close. But we'll never forget the Netherlands. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're muted, Your Worship. Thank you, sir. That was very uh, nice. That was very touching. Wasn't that nice? I know. Yeah, I thought was that was touching. just. Yeah, thank yeah. you. She's such a sweet lady and sharp, sharp as a tack. Um, also, I know we we're aware, but on uh, March the 29th, we had the premier in town, and he was joined by the tourism minister, Lisa McLeod, and the finance minister, Peter Bethenfalvey, and they were here to support tourism. We just like to thank the government for their continued support and contributions to our sectors that are hurting. We had 15 downtown grand openings uh, a few weeks ago. Kudos to the downtown for such a neat and innovative idea. It captured a lot of attention. As a matter of fact, we did some major broadcasts, including CP24 on this because they picked up on the news and uh, we're really excited that even during a pandemic, there's some uh, silver linings during some gray clouds. And it was really nice to see that we've got some, some neat things happening during challenging times. Um, here, oh yeah, there's our picture. Sorry, I should have noticed that there was a picture. That was from when the Premier was here. You can see I was joined by Councillor Cario, right next to the Premier. And uh, I was joined by Mayor Easton and um, Mayor DeCero, as well as some other local, oh, and MPP Oosterhof, as well as some other local um, business people as well. So we had a small intimate gathering at Table Rock and uh, we were, uh, we we're really happy that he chose to come to Niagara Falls and, and, and he had a lot of interesting things to say. He was very supportive and it was nice to have him in town. Um, Steve Ludzik, we'll talk about Steve for a second. Uh, he just had his surgery uh, the other day, number 29. We all did our picture, we're all wearing, oh, there's Mike, we're number 29, Ludzi. Uh, he just had his transplant and oh my gosh, if you go on Marianne, his wife's uh, Facebook page, you can see the struggles they've had. Wow, it's been unbelievable. What a roller coaster. But Finally, the good news, uh, they found a donor who was a match, and so far the surgery went great. Now we're sending lots of positive vibes and, and prayers and good intentions for a full recovery. And as well, I know we turned the falls red 
for Parkinson's Awareness Month and in honor of Steve himself on Sunday, April the 11th. So we're proud of you. We're happy for you. God bless you, Steve. And uh, we're all in your corner. Matter of fact, even when I was on uh, CH last week and they were asking me about Steve, they said, oh, he's a good friend of the of CH. So they're real excited. To, uh, matter of fact, they want to talk more about him than, than, than me. But that's OK. That's OK. It's you know, good share. Good limelight. Anyway, moving on. Uh, vaccination clinics are returning to the McBain Center um, this Thursday, April the 22nd. And the following Tuesday, the 27th, as well as next Thursday, April the 29th, and then the following day, Friday. So this Thursday and next Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at the McBain Center. So we're looking forward to another successful rotation at this clinic. It has been one of the most successful and efficient locations in the Niagara region. So we just want to thank the community. We've got so much positive feedback from all the people that are there. So it's very efficient. And just a reminder, just come five minutes early. Don't come any earlier than that because they won't allow you in. Um, but just come just before, wait in your car, and then be prepared with your health card and follow the rules. Uh, there was a TVO documentary recently called Tripping the Niagara. It was popular and it was an immersive series. And it highlighted the 24 kilometers along the Niagara River, had historical facts, vineyards, orchards, talked about the falls, white water, it premiered on TVO on Friday, April the 2nd, and it's streaming now on TVO.org. Our next council meeting will be Tuesday, May the 11th, and that concludes the mayor's announcements. Well, thank you for that. And Heather, thank you for helping me along with the, uh, the visuals. Great job. Okay, we're moving on to presentations. Item 6.1, City of Niagara Falls uh, Employment Lands and Strategy. Um, Mr. Clerk, who are we going to, uh, are we going to get Mr. Hurlovich to lead us on this? Conflict, Mr. Mayor. We have a conflict with, we have a conflict with Councilor Lococo. And Councilor Peter Angelo. And Councilor Peter Angelo. So, uh, Your Worship, we have Adam Fisher and Jamie Cook. They're consultants from Land Economics, and they're on standby here and they will have a presentation to give to council on the uh, Niagara Falls Employment Land Strategy Phase 2 report. Okay, um, Alex Rilovich, will you be introducing them or are we just gonna bring up our presenters, uh, Adam Fisher? Yes, thank you, Worship. I think uh, the city clerk just basically introduced them. Okay. Uh, they'll explain the purpose of this study and uh, their phase one findings, and uh, we'll be seeking council's uh, endorsement to proceed with phase two. So thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Ilovich. So uh, Mr. Fisher, are you there? Hi, it's uh, Jamie Cook here. I'll be uh, leading the presentation with Adam. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, here you find. Great. Okay. If uh, I believe um, is the clerk going to provide us our slide deck uh, on the screen, um, Mr. Clerk. Great. Thank you very much. Go. So, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council, and staff. Uh, it's a pleasure to be before you today. Um, I'm Jamie Cook. I'm a partner with Watson Associates, and I'm here with Adam Fisher, who's also a consultant with Watson Associates. And we're going to be presenting you the draft findings of the phase one and two analysis of the City of Niagara Falls employment strategy. If you can go to the first slide, the uh, the purpose of this uh, report was to, sorry, before I get into the purpose, I just wanted to introduce the team. Um, Again, Watson & Associates is a lead consulting firm with this team, and we've partnered with Dillon Consulting as well as MDB Insight to ultimately prepare uh, this report. In terms of the purpose of the report, the uh, ultimate purpose or goal of this report is to develop a long-term vision and planning policy framework for the city, which will enhance the city's competitive position for industrial and office employment, as well as other employment support uses in the city's employment areas. So these are particularly the areas that accommodate industrial type development throughout the city. There's a number of key outcomes of this study. One of them is uh, a long-term land needs analysis. That's a real core aspect of the study, which also inform 
the Niagara Region Municipal Conference review process and ultimately input into their uh, assessment of long-term demand for employment lands within the city of Niagara Falls. Uh, a second key component is a public uh, engagement and stakeholder consultation process that we'll be looking to engage uh, in this spring, as well as a series of policy and strategic recommendations to inform the city's official plan as part of its uh, official plan review process. Just also want to point out that there are three phases of the study. Um, there's Phase one, which is a technical analysis that looks at existing conditions and trends on employment lands. Phase two is the long-term needs assessment and strategic policy recommendations, which is largely what we're going to be talking today to you about. And then phase three is an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment that will follow the stakeholder consultation process um, and then finalize that with a, a final report and final presentation to council. Uh, in terms of the... Um, policy framework um, on this slide here. Just wanted to point out there are um, a number of key uh, policy documents that we uh, that we're working with that and have been prepared uh, or we prepared this uh, work underneath under that policy framework. Uh, the first is the City of Niagara Falls official plan uh, itself and this document will form a key background study to the official plan review for the city of Niagara Falls and the update of that ultimate uh, official plan report. The report also builds on the guiding principles and vision for the Niagara region official plan. And then lastly, this ELS has also been prepared in the context of the provincial growth plan, a place to grow, and the provincial policy uh, statement, which was updated last, uh, last May in 2020. There's a couple of key aspects of the PPS and the growth plan that I just wanted to point out that we'll be addressing throughout this, that are addressed throughout the report and we'll be addressing in the presentation. One of them is uh, the um, direction regarding long-term land needs and uh, economic development, as well as the competitiveness and protection of employment uh, lands uh, over the long term. Um, the growth plan, just to be clear, allows municipalities to designate employment areas based on identified land needs up to the year 2051. So that's the long term planning horizon that we're allowed to project uh, employment lands to. We are able to project longer uh, for infrastructure needs and uh, other um, um, planning uh, and, uh, and, and servicing issues, but ultimately we can only designate to a 25 year horizon. Uh, economic development and competitiveness is promoted by uh, providing opportunities for a diversified employment base and an appropriate range and mix of employment uses in non-residential areas throughout the city's urban and non uh, or, or rural areas. Uh, this also uh, includes requirements to facilitate conditions for economic investment by identify, identifying strategic sites for investment, including market ready sites for development uh, in the near term. And lastly, a key aspect of the provincial policy statement and the growth plan is around the issue of protection of employment areas. And through that uh, lens, we've identified a number of potential conversion um, candidates for conversion from an employment area to a non-employment use. And we've identified that through both the provincial uh, lens and a local um, market and, and planning lens as well. And, and that's gonna be touched on throughout this study as well and, and identified and detailed in the report. Next slide. I'm going to turn it to Adam to provide a bit of a background on some of the land supply results and existing uh, trends analysis. Thank you, Jamie. So if we look to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the city of Niagara Falls currently has a uh, total employment land supply of approximately 1,100 uh, gross hectares. And as we can see in this pie chart, uh, presently, uh, just over half of this employment land supply does fall outside of the city's employment areas. Uh, but when we do look to the vacant land supply for uh, future development, uh, it is all within the city's employment areas. And as you can see at the bottom here, uh, the city presently has uh, 60 gross hectares of vacant uh, employment land available, which uh, does only represent 5% of the total uh, employment land supply. And when we next look to the next slide, we provide a breakdown of this uh, vacant employment land with some greater detail, um, looking at the, the uh, distribution across the city's employment areas. And we can see that only three of the seven employment areas within the city still do have a vacant uh, land supply remaining. And uh, as you can see on the right of this, uh, this slide here, that a bulk of this land 
is located within the North Niagara Falls Secure Storage Employment Area with 43 of the 60 hectares. And what we also display here is this vacant land supply broken down by shovel ready and serviceable status. And how we define shovel ready here is employment lands that are identified as lands which abut uh, an arterial collector or local road and have sanitary, sanitary water and storm stubbed at the property line. And similar to the overall vacant land supply, we do see a bulk of this shovel ready supply within the North Niagara Falls Secure Storage Employment Area. And I uh, will discuss this in a bit more detail in the coming slides. Um, but if we can move to the next slide here. And one more, please, on the city's target employment sectors <clears throat> on employment lands. Uh, we've identified uh, uh, five uh, key sectors here, uh, the first of which is advanced manufacturing. So this is and will continue to be accommodated within the city, it will continue to be an important sector to accommodate uh, employment growth. Uh, and employment areas such as the Stanley Avenue Business Park uh, currently facilitate such uses. And when we look forward uh, over the forecast period, uh, we're, we're looking towards uh, lands that have good uh, highway access and a range of parcel sizes, uh, particularly large parcels, which can uh, accommodate uh, these businesses as they grow and expand over time. And another, of course, key sector for the city is uh, sorry, still on that slide, please, is construction. And unlike advanced manufacturing, this can be supported on a, a wider range of parcels where things such as highway access isn't uh, necessarily as important to access the uh, customer base uh, as it is in these other sectors. And when we look to these three remaining sectors that are largely knowledge-based, knowledge uh, again, they don't require overly large parcels and we're typically seeing design uh, associated with a campus-like setting in these sectors for new developments, which is closer to amenities, uh, closer to transit, and is being facilitated with walkable environments. Uh, and facilitating such employment in the city, is, it's quite important for youth retention and maintaining a, a skilled labor force over time. Um, and of course, the, the city of Niagara Falls is in uh, looking into the medical research business park uh, next to the uh, new hospital, which would be the first of its kind for the city and would support such important employment uses. And if we go to the next slide. So here we have just a, a brief overview of the city's existing employment areas. And we are gonna pay particular focus just to the North Niagara Falls Secure Storage Employment Area, because as mentioned earlier, it does make up a, a bulk of the vacant land supply, but there are, there are several important distinctions to make about this. Um, so first, just as a general overview, uh, this employment area does have uh, quite a diverse employment base. There's no real discernible industry concentration which exists here. Um, whereas if you look to another uh, employment area, such as the Stanley Avenue Business Park, you would see that concentration in more traditional manufacturing. But uh, here we have a wide range of employment industries. Another feature of this employment area is there are limited opportunities for intensification at the moment, uh, whether that be through, through redevelopment or expansion. So much of uh, these growth and development efforts in the future will be uh, oriented towards this employment area's vacant land supply. However, uh, it is important to note that the age of this employment area, uh, as well as its remaining vacant uh, land supply, speaks to the lack of demand that we've historically seen here. And this can be attributed to several factors, uh, such as expensive land costs, uh, limited, QE, uh, limited direct uh, QEW access, uh, high levels of residential encroachment and land use incompatibility, as well as parcel fragmentation. Uh, when we put all this together, it's, it's important to recognize while there is vacant land with this employment area, uh, we do have to be mindful of the historical difficulties of vacant land absorption in this area, and we don't want to overstate uh, the ability of this vacant land supply to be developed in the short to medium term. And if we look to the next slide, we just have a general overview of the other six employment areas within the city. And Mr. Just Mayor, can I just ask the Hello. question? Yes, 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 of course. What is vacant land absorption? Thank what you. does that mean? So that would mean that a parcel is, yeah, of course. 
A parcel that is uh, currently identified as vacant would then be the site of development. So once that development occurs on the site and it's no longer considered uh, vacant, we would classify that land as being absorbed. Thank you. Uh, yes, so on, on these uh, six remaining employment areas, uh, there are minimal vacant and underutilized uh, lands remaining, and uh, much of the future growth will be largely limited to redevelopment and expansion opportunities. Uh, as mentioned, uh, just the Montrose and Stanley Avenue employment areas uh, account for the 15 hectares of vacant land remaining here. So future planning efforts should focus on the retention of these employment lands and promoting intensification where possible. Uh, however, it's, it's important to note that expansion and in intensification are largely at the discretion of landowners. And I'm now going to pass it back to Jamie Cook to speak to the employment forecast and land demand to 51. Thanks, Adam. So uh, on the next slide, I'm just going to uh, start in with the employment forecast that we prepared for the City of Niagara Falls over the 2016 to 51 planning horizon. So a lot of work's gone into assessing the overall macroeconomic trend and regional growth trends and driving factors and disruptive factors with respect to employment growth in Niagara region and Niagara Falls over the long term to help inform this forecast. We also have the Niagara region forecast that's being prepared as part of the their municipal comprehensive review. And as you may uh, be aware, that forecast has, has recently been updated uh, to reflect the amendment to the growth plan to extend the planning horizon from 2041 to 2051. So we now have a longer term horizon, uh, as well as um, a number of um, refinements to the to the growth plan as a part of uh, as part of that am amendment to uh, the 2019 growth plan. One of the key amendments is the growth forecasts that are provided in the growth plan are now established minimums. And so uh, higher forecasts can be justified through the regional MCR, but these are the minimum forecasts ultimately that are being identified in the growth plan and then being allocated to each of the area municipalities. And so we've gone into a, a considerable amount of detail looking at that allocation for Niagara Falls. Over the 2016 to 51 forecast period, we're projecting the city's total employment base to increase by about 17,000 employees or total jobs from 42,000 to 59,000. Overall, that's an annual growth rate of about 1% a year. Uh, it's a little bit higher than how the city's been, been growing over the last uh, 15 years from 2001 to 2016 at about 0.8%. And relative to the regional growth rate, it's, it's pretty comparable at an overall 1% growth rate for the region as well. Next slide. So then from that analysis, we've um, prepared a detailed breakdown of the employment forecast by sector, building on some of the target sector analysis uh, details that Adam had just presented. Uh, and then from there, those target sectors are then categorized into what we would call employment uh, land use categories. The three major, uh, or sorry, four major employment categories include major office, which is defined as standalone office uh, space. Um, 20,000 square feet or greater, population related employment, which is largely employment that would be driven by population growth and also would include personal service uses and institutional, uh, most institutional forms of employment. And we have employment land employment, which is largely the industrial type development that we're focusing on here as part of this report and presentation. And then lastly, rural employment. And so you can see overall, uh, we've projected uh, from 2020 to 51, just over 17,000 jobs. About 3,000 of those jobs are identified uh, or projected to be accommodated in employment areas. So these are again, the, um, the uh, employment areas are sometimes referred to as industrial areas that Adam uh, previously spoke to throughout the city. And we've allocated that by um, land use category. So most of the employment growth in industrial areas is gonna be employment land type employment, but there's also some employment supportive uses in the retail and um, uh, personal service categories that are also permitted and would be expected to be accommodated as well. On, on the next slide then, we've assessed that demand for employment um, to the supply. So ultimately what we do is we look at that overall amount of employment growth, compare or assign an overall density assumption to that employment over the long term to then identify a demand for employment land 
and then compare that with the available supply of vacant employment lands that are available to, uh, to be developed over the long term to identify the need. So at this time, we have identified uh, preliminary findings on need. Um, we're not um, providing specifics uh, at this time uh, to this council presentation, but we would generally identify that overall the technical results identify that there will be a shortfall of employment land to accommodate uh, employment land demand over the next 20 years and ultimately um, that will increase as we as we extend to that full 25 year planning horizon. So as part of this official plan review, it's recommended that the city begin exploring lands for uh, future urban expansion or um, or potentially conversion of existing lands within the city's urban area to an employment use designation to accommodate long-term employment demand um, to 2051. Next slide. So just to uh, reiterate a little bit on the supply, um, as uh, Adam pointed out there, there is about 59 hectares uh, in total of employment land left within the municipality. However, uh, it's important to note that a lot of that employment is accommodated in the uh, self-storage employment area. There are some potential market, market challenges that we've identified within that area. We'd also note that as the city's existing employment base starts to um, mature, it is becoming more fragmented. The um, remaining sites that are available are also relatively small. There's only about five sites remaining that are greater than five hectares, which can pose some challenges to the city's ability to accommodate um, and be competitive in its position in accommodating larger scale employment uses, uh, particularly in the industrial and uh, uh, logistics type sectors, for example. So um, just important to make sure that that employment is being monitored and also recognized in terms of some of the limitations that um, exist. And we have factored some of those limitations in our analysis by um, discounting some of that supply uh, through a land vacancy adjustment, which is just bas basically an adjustment to assume that uh, that assumes that some of this supply may not be fully developed over the long term planning horizon. Next slide. So as part of our analysis in phase two, we have provided a series of policy recommendations. Um, there are a number of themes that um, that were explored with respect to uh, these overall policy recommendations. One of the key themes is um, just to ensure the, the future um, and implement the future vision of the city's employment lands. Uh, it's a key vision for the city to provide uh, a diverse collection of parcels and opportunities within greenfield development areas as well as intensification areas of existing sites to allow the city to uh, competitively respond to market demand to meet the city's needs in 2051. So as part of that um, vision, we have um, identified policies to strengthen the, um, the long-term viability for existing and planned industries. Um, we've added policies to recognize um, employment areas need to be located near uh, or in proximity to goods movement facilities and corridors and that those employment areas should be protected uh, we've also identified policies for um, developing uh, active transportation networks and transit supportive uh, built forms and employment areas. Uh, we've also identified the need to um, uh, provide um, consistency in the, the overall uh, designation of employment areas within the framework of the, the uh, growth plan and PPS and ultimately how it's identified in the regions official plan schedules of urban structure schedules and so uh, at the moment the city identifies employment areas that align with the regions overlay of the designated employment area but it also identifies industrial areas we've we've looked at those industrial areas made recommendations whether those areas should be brought into the employment area designation or with whether some of those industrial areas should be considered for a conversion to a non-employment use so those are some of the key aspects that uh, were undertaken as part of this overall theme of uh, the long-term vision. Um, next slide deals with the issue of employment land conversion. So as I mentioned, the protection of employment areas is a key policy direction of the, uh, the, the provincial policy statement and the growth plan and all the way down to the regional and local official plan. Um, however, it is identified that in certain circumstances, it may be appropriate to convert uh, an employment use to a non-employment use if the need can be justified and there are no uh, major um, 
uh, issues with respect to its impact on the plan function of the, the overall um, employment area over time. The provincial policy framework essentially sets out the broader term um, framework for establishing uh, uh, criteria for, for reviewing um, employment conversions. That's largely based on the, uh, the criteria of is there a need for the conversion and then are, is there a need for uh, if you're converting employment land, will you be short in terms of your ability to accommodate employment growth if you if you convert? It also touches on servicing issues and uh, cross-jurisdictional issues and mis municipal interest issues. But there can also be local issues that are also that need to be looked at from a planning perspective and land uh, or market perspective, where you might have a shortfall of employment land, but it may be ultimately um, the existing lands may be the wrong location. So it's it's important to look at both the quality and quantity of employment land. So we've developed a, a detailed convert, conversion criteria matrix and, and evaluation process in looking at conversion sites. Um, there's about um, nine sites in total that were reviewed and we've made recommendations overall to um, um, identify um, some sites where uh, either expanded permissions to um, mixed use type uh, employment would be permitted or should be recommended or uh, in some cases where a conversion could be uh, should be entertained and then in most cases we've identified policies and recommendations to uh, protect the existing structure uh, and uh, not recommend a conversion and the details of that are all provided in the report with respect to employment land need as i mentioned um, we've identified an overall need um, uh, for uh, additional land expansion or um, bringing new lands within the existing boundary into an employment designation. Uh, and that's something that will be explored as we move into the uh, end of phase two and into phase three, um, consulting with uh, the stakeholders and ultimately exploring these options for, for future expansion um, through the official plan amendment. Um, lastly, there's policies in the uh, draft document that deal with competitiveness and the, the competitiveness of the city's supply. Um, some of those policies speak to encouraging a range of parcels uh, and development pri priorities to ensure that the supply of shovel ready lands for medium and larger sites. As I mentioned, the city does have a very limited amount of, of sites uh, that are uh, available now. Uh, we've also identified policies that need to be um, looked at to, um, to acknowledge the um, overall structural changes in the macro economy and the local changes that we're seeing with respect to how we plan for employment areas as we move from a goods producing economy to a more knowledge based and service uh, sector based economy. And that means that we may see less typical industrial type uses and more, uh, more of a mix of uh, industrial and non industrial uses being occupied in employment areas, including more light type industrial uses, uh, integrated uses as, as well as office type uses. And, that also requires more direction on uh, providing amenities and employment supportive uses that are going to attract, attract uh, labor, you know, to these employment areas and make these areas an, an, an attractive destination for people to come to work um, over, over the long term. And so when we think about planning for employment areas, the issue of placemaking becomes also very relevant in, in how we plan. Um, so that's, um, some of, some of the highlights of some of the key policy recommendations that, that we've made. Uh, moving on to the conclusions on the uh, next slide here, um, we have concluded that the, uh, the city should strengthen its policies to protect and retain uh, its existing vacant employment land supply to ensure that uh, future demand for employment uh, land uh, development is not constrained by a lack of mar market choice through its remaining employment parcels uh, and not constrained by conflicting uses or encroachment um, by residential or other non-employment uses. We have also identified that the city is expected to experience a shortfall of employment lands before 2041. And um, this shortfall accompanied with the difficulty of marketing the North uh, Niagara Falls uh, secure storage employment area will require a new employment area to be identified and be developed. Um, and so we're seeking council's direction to uh, proceed with um, that um, uh, next phase of work um, and to engage with uh, stakeholders to discuss the results of this, uh, this work in the spring of this year. Um, so as part of the official plan review, we have identified that need to explore future employment area designations. 
um, or uh, again within either within or with outside of the city's current urban boundary to ensure that the long-term forecast can be accommodated. So moving on to the next steps, just on slide 24, or 20, I guess 22, um, we um, were asking the cities uh, for authorization today uh, to proceed with uh, an open house uh, and engagement uh, to finalize a study uh, through the uh, the spring, summer, and ultimately the fall of this year. A stakeholder session in public open houses, uh, a virtual session is currently being planned uh, for uh, the late spring of this year. That will follow by a draft official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment. There'll be a statutory public meeting uh, required for that amendment. And then a final official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment will be pre prepared along with the final report and then we'll be coming back to council in the fall of this year to deliver the phase three results. So that concludes our presentation. We're happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, do we have any, here we go, any questions of council for the presenters? Okay, I do have one question uh, for you for whoever wants to answer it. So my one question was in regard to the one slide you don't need to call it up, but for the employment forecast, you know, when you were showing 1% year growth, 1% uh, year growth rate? Yes. So I'm guessing you're looking at the provincial um, projections um, that were unfortunately done pre-COVID because I brought this up recently at the uh, region as well. And I guess the concern is um, that these numbers may not accurately reflect what's actually going on because as I'm sure you're aware, we're going through quite a boom and uh, an exodus from major urban areas and they're coming to places like Niagara Falls. And of course, as a result, we're having a, a housing boom like we've never had um, and uh, stock shortages in all categories. So my question is the, the numbers you base that on were 1% a year growth rate. Um, have you factored in some variance that that may in fact not accurately reflect, reflect what's happening uh, going forward to 2051? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great uh, question. Um, we've been tracking the impacts of COVID on a pretty regular basis, and we've got a lot of detail that's provided in the report that we just didn't get into tonight on that in terms of labor force impacts and employment impacts. Uh, you know, COVID's impacting um, growth across the GGH um, in various ways. It's, you know, as you mentioned, it's affecting an the residential market and it's having an accelerating impact on residential. It's it's disrupting the the, um, the non-residential sector in some ways. It's accelerating certain sectors and it's it's creating some challenges in other sectors that are more obviously more physically based. Um, and we would expect some of these trends are going to continue uh, into the longer term. We're likely not going to you know pivot back to a pre-COVID type environment uh, very quickly, and we may we may be uh, likely um, uh, shifting uh, and pivoting, like like you mentioned, um, to some extent for for the longer term, um, we've identified that. Um, I guess I would just say it's been identified in a lot of the work that's already been done through not as much through the growth plan, but through the Ministry of Finance that this shift in in employment and outward growth pressure for both uh, employment and population has been occurring even before the pandemic occurred. And now this is accelerating that shift. So some of that outward growth pressure and that shift that that um, was already being experienced is, has already been factored in to the forecast, which is one of the reasons why the, the growth rate is higher. Um, looking forward, if you look on the graph, like the, the absolute amount of growth is quite a bit stronger than it was in the previous period. Um, there could be some disruption, you know, in, in uh, we would imagine in certain sectors, particularly the office sector and in um, the retail sector as a result of disruption from e-commerce. And that's likely going to put even more pressure in, in some respects to on employment land absorption, but it may take some, some demand off certain sectors like um, uh, office development in, in the downtown area, but it's uh, a little bit... Um, early to make predictions, but we've done our best. I mean, it's a long answer, but we've done our best because it's a complicated question to try to assess this. I think the best answer is that um, we have some, just to finish this, we have some sort of constraints that we have a fairly rigid provincial 
policy framework and, and growth allocation framework that we've tried to work within. And uh, we think the forecast is is um, re reflective of these trends and it's it's somewhat aspirational uh, and so reflecting some of these particular upward trends that we may see. But you will have the opportunity to review this forecast multiple times before this planning horizon has come to fruition. So I would suggest monitoring becomes a really key a key aspect at this point to, to ensure that you know you're making sure you're not shortchanged over the longer term. So I do apologize for the long answer on that, but I wanted to make sure I was thorough. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Jamie. I've got Councillor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Jamie, I think I read through this. I'm I, I highlighted it all on my iPad, and I happen to have to use my laptop for the actual agenda. But the importance of protecting our industrial land so that we don't have um, too much commercial or too much residential infringing upon our industrial land, for example, out where um, Washington Mills and Solid Steel is, and the importance of keeping that separate. It, that was in your report somewhere, wasn't it? Yes. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm having a bit of a tough time recalling the specific uh, site, but um, I will just say broadly that um, it is a key theme throughout the report, um, right from the beginning of looking at the policy framework to the recommendations that the protection of your employment areas is critical. Uh, once those lands are converted, you're not getting them back. And there are, in, in most cases, um, there are certain location requirements that only uh, employment areas can really locate in. They, um, so they have to be reserved and protected for those large scale type uses and Obviously, they can have impacts, land use impacts that can affect um, um, the surrounding areas. And so it, it's not so much the, the industrial uses that typically pose the, the problem of land use conflicts. It's the other uses that, that come into the area, encroach into the employment area, then they ultimately have a, a problem uh, with issues with noise or safety uh, that can then drive the existing industries out. And so it's important to make sure that those policy are, are uh, well established, but it's also important to make sure that we don't uh, unnecessarily protect employment areas that, that aren't marketable or shouldn't be protected um, and that maybe would be better suited for a mixed use type use or you know more commercial or even residential use. And so we've identified that in the report at quite a bit of detail. Well, thank you. I was, I was glad to see that because we do, we do have somewhat of a conflict of land use going out closer to the Stanley Avenue, Washington, am I in the right? Stanley Avenue, Washington Mills, Solid Steel over there. And, and I would hate to see us make it to the point where they decide to leave as opposed to continuing to make concessions so they are not bothering other land uses. So I was glad to see that in there. Sorry. Thank you for that, Councillor. I have Councillor Cario. Thank you, Your Worship. I also like the part in the report that we shouldn't be fooled by thinking there's employment employment land that's not usable usable in the study, and if it's never going to be used for for employment land, we should use it for what it's best suited for. Where there's uh, um, uh, residential encroaching on it, it'll never be used for, for uh, industrial or employment land. So I think it's better to deal with that sooner than later. And then if we have to find uh, some industrial land to put in our inventory, put it where it doesn't conflict with other things. I see that that was well explained in the study. And I think the sooner that we deal with that, the better as well. Thank you, Your Worship. And I'll be prepared to move the recommendations. Okay, do we have any other questions or comments of council? <clears throat> okay, seeing none, we've got two we've got two recommendations. One that council received the presentation regarding the city of Niagara Falls employment land strategy, and two that council direct staff to proceed to phase three of the st strategic the strategy, sorry, including consultation with the community. That's moved by Councillor Cario, seconded by Councillor Thompson. We'll call the vote. All those in favor. Thank you. That's unanimous. Thank you for that. So we've got to get a couple of counselors back in the room. So we're, we got to get, oh, there's Victor and looking for Lori. So could somebody reach out to Lori before we move on? Okay, <laughs> Councillor Iannone's got, I'm gonna reach out to, there we go. There we go, Councillor Lococo. Okay, so we're good to go. Okay, thank you. We just finished item 6.1 on the employment land strategy. And we're moving on to reports. So item 
7.1 uh, encroachment agreement with the city. And um, Mr. Lustig, did you want to uh, introduce the, the report? You've got three recommendations. Or not. Uh, perhaps I could just interject. Uh, while we're waiting for Ed, we could introduce that we have John Pellegrino. He's representing the Hilton, and he is on standby to speak to this matter as well. Uh, in lieu of Ed being online, well, there he is there. Uh, we'll just let Ed speak first if he wants to introduce the report first or hear from Mr. Pellegrino first. All right, um, Mr. Can you hear me? Yours. Yeah, we hear you fine. Okay, good. Um, I was having a little difficulty. So this is a straightforward encroachment agreement for a canopy for um, the Hilton property. And uh, the report is, um, I think, um, very clear that uh, staff has reviewed it and has no negative comments so that we're um, recommending that the council authorize us to enter into the agreement. It's a standard type of agreement and protects the city. Okay. I would move the recommendation, Your Worship. Okay. Moved by Councillor Pierangelo, second by Councillor Thompson. Do we have any discussion to the motion? Uh, Councillor Thompson, you're muted right now. You're muted. We can't hear you. You're muted. There you go. That's better. Yep. That's be well, I don't know. I just wouldn't say it's better, but we can hear you now. I, I think in this pandemic that it's uh, appropriate to support any of the businesses that are coming in who want to utilize their property for business. And this, uh, I remember sitting outside there at that same location, watching Jay Cochran walk across from the skyline. And that's a great spot to have a canopy and uh, have people there. So I'm delighted to second that. And I know the staff has done all their work. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Well, if there's no further discussion, why don't we just call the vote then? Uh, all those in favor. Okay, and that's unanimous. So thank you to John. I know John Pellegrino, you're on standby if need be, but uh, it's not necessary. Thank you for being there and have a, have a good night. Okay, moving on. 7.2, potential waiver of municipal business licenses. So this will be Mr. Matson. Uh, Mr. Matson, um, I'm sure everyone's aware, but we're looking at waiving some business license that, that you want to explain to the council. Yes, Your Mayor, uh, just to explain further, we did have uh, a motion from council a couple of meetings ago, um, looking at waiving potentially business license fees. The report does mention that we could specifically just hone in on a few of the uh, business licenses, and I'm here to answer any questions of council. Councillor Dabrowski. Yeah, thanks, um, Your Worship. Yeah, I want to thank staff for turning around the, the report so quickly. Um, uh, Mr. Madsen mentioned it, that uh, there's two options as part of the report, one which would have a $95,000 impact on on uh, potential tax um, back to the residents. And then I, I like the idea of honing in, um, just to steal that word from Mr. Mattson, on, on the businesses that have been affected the most. And, and the report outlines it from uh, barbershops, bowling alleys, um, palm brokers, public halls, restaurants. So I like to make a motion that we support the staff recommendation based on the uh, the cost back at 36000 um and waiving those business fees. Um, specifically for the businesses that are outlined that were more significantly impacted through COVID-19. Okay, so we've got motion by Councillor Dabrowski, second by Councillor Campbell. Do we have any other discussions to this motion? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that is unanimous. Thank you for that. Moving on to item 7.3. 2020 Sleep Cheap event, Wonder Falls Pass. Councillor Peter Angelo, did you want to address this as the chair of Sleep Cheap? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Your Worship. As you know, it was a bit of a toned down version this year. We didn't have any 
Um, we didn't have any of the wonderfuls past your worship and uh, we didn't have all of the hotels as well. It was very voluntary this year for who wanted to participate, but we are very thankful to the ones that did participate. I think we were fortunate, Your Worship, in the sense that um, the time that Sleep Cheap happened this year, the numbers that we were experiencing right across Ontario were, were very low. So I'm um, thankful to the businesses that were able to give, you know, the local residents a, a bit of a vacation because vacations were very difficult this year. And I uh, appreciate them raising money for some charities in our city, Your Worship. I'd be happy to move the motion. Thank you for that, Councillor Pierangelo. Seconded by Councillor Strange. And you're right, it was a challenging year. Uh, hey, we, at least we had to do, we did something. And the other thing people got to remember, charities are hurting this year too. Uh, they're, they're, they've dried up. So it's good there were some things for some people. So motion by Councillor Pierangelo, the chair, and seconded by Councillor Strange. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Sleep cheap. Okay, thank you. That was unanimous. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Mr. Item Mayor, if I could... Yes, Councillor like just yep. interrupt. Yeah, congratulations on that initiative. I'm looking at the report. It's raised over two million dollars since 2004. That's that's impressive. So, congrats to yourself and Councillor Peter Angelo as well. Oh, thank you. Yep, and we've been plugging away at it. <laughs> it wasn't the most exciting year this year for it, but at least we kept going. That's the main thing. Uh, item 7.4: uh, Tax and Water Rebate Program for People with Disabilities. So. This report is brought to us by uh, John Levins. Uh, I think everyone's read the report. Yes, Councillor Peter Angelo is budget chair. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Uh, just, a, just a couple of questions. So staff is looking for direction in terms of uh, stacking the programs. And the way that I understand it is there already exists a program for, uh, for seniors that are on low income. And staff are suggesting that any programs that are related to ODSP are not stacked on top of that. Am I correct in that, Your Worship? Okay, can we get some clarity from John? John, are you, oh, there you are. Okay, John, did you wanna just clear that up, please? Yes, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Peter Angelo. Yes, that is correct. Okay, um, Your Worship, the report uh, goes through um, uh, tax and water rebates for people with disabilities, people that are on uh, Ontario Disability Support Program. Um, I, I, I think it would be a great gesture, uh, Your Worship, for the city to uh, endorse these type of programs. And I would agree with the staff in the sense that um, we, you know, we maybe could do away with stacking them um, so that, you know, they're either re receiving the tax and the water rebate from ODSP or they're receiving it from the uh, from the low income senior program. Um, and if staff are looking for a motion, I'd be happy to make that motion. And in, and I, in, in the same sense, I'd be happy to choose option number two, your worship, which would mean that those rebates would start this year. So I'll make that a motion. Okay, bless you. Okay, we have a motion by Councillor Pierangelo, second by Councillor Campbell, and I've got Councillor Lococo that I'd like to address this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was very pleased to see the information that came back from staff. Um, I, I do think that it would be a goodwill gesture to our community. And when you look at the breakdown, um, we didn't really know how many people on ODSP would be homeowners. So um, just from um, the information that I know, I'm thinking maybe 50% up to 75%. So the, the impact on the taxpayer would not that much, but I think it would really support a lot of our residents. Um, so I, I would support it as well. Thank you for that. Any other comments or questions of council? Yeah, and I felt the same way. I was curious to know where it was going to fall, which category, what portion own versus rent, you know, but, uh, but either way, I, I think it's a great, it's a great program. So um, we will call the vote then. All those in favor. Okay. And that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Um, item 7.5, property tax penalty and interest rate. So we've got, that's another one uh, by John, and we've got Councillor Cario. Uh, Councillor Cario, did you want to go first? I'm sure, uh, Your Worship. Um, I was watching the news today, and uh, uh, our Prime Minister has extended the uh, help that the federal government is offering to people uh, until end of September which tells us that we're not out of this yet 
in that uh, a lot of our businesses are not open. Uh, a lot of our people are not employed. Uh, and um, people are still going to have trouble paying their taxes. And I think that we should not end this today, that this should go on until COVID is at least uh, a, a turning the corner and getting behind us. This is one of the only things, I mean, along with one of the other things we just did, uh, but this is one of the only things that the city does to help the people in our municipality that are struggling today. It's one of the only things we can do. Uh, and it's my feeling and some of the other councillors' feelings that uh, the amount of money that we do charge uh, when we can is, is a bit on the high side anyway. But until uh, we get out of this, I think we should not uh, do number one. I think we need to go to number two and continue on this path of, of uh, helping the people by a lower, a lower, a still an interest rate, but a lower amount. And uh, at least until, at least until um, we're, we turn the corner, get out of COVID. So I, at the appropriate time, I'd be moving uh, recommendation number two and that staff come back with it at a future date. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, I got Councillor Campbell, is your hand? Yeah, Councillor Campbell. Uh, Vince, uh, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, my point is, why don't we tie it in with decisions made by the federal government so we're not uh, at odds with anything. We're all on the same plan, long-term plan, short-term plan. Does that make I, sense? I think it's a great idea. We tied in, like I said, that Trudeau has extended his to September 25th, and I think that we should do the same. Okay, add Thank that date that. in there, and I, I, I moved the motion. That's fantastic. Well, right now, September 25th is the date for the wage and rent subsidy uh, program. And I do want to compliment you, Councillor Campbell. You have your hand up uh, uh, with the computer, the digital hand. I'm impressed. That's, uh, that's a pretty good uh, technical advance uh, that you did there. For those of you that aren't aware, that's at the bottom of your screen. You should see a raise hand thing. So, uh, you know, if you want to get technical, that's all. But good job. So we've got uh, discussions by Councillor Cario and Councillor Campbell. Anybody else want to weigh in on the discussion? Okay, seeing none, Councillor Cario, did you want to make the motion then? Yes. Okay, so, <laughs> so motion by uh, Councillor Cario that we go with recommendation number two, where we maintain the same um, tax rate for um, property taxes, um, uh, penalty and interest, uh, and secondly, that we not come back, I guess, before September 25th. Um, that's when the, as of today, that's when the uh, wage subsidy program uh, goes until. So yeah, is that there, how you want to make your motion? For, well, your worship, that, that go till the 25th as well. Okay, so we've got that uh, moved and seconded by Councillor Campbell. Yes. Okay, and I've got uh, Councillor Dabrowski. Do you have your hand up, Councilor? No, it's fine. And just in speaking about the federal subsidy, I know that it does it on the 25th, and they're rolling out it in kind of phases, I guess, where um, they'll, they'll limit the amount that people are getting. I was going to recommend that we just go until the end of the year, but I don't want to uh, make a moot point here. September 25th is fine. Happy to support that motion. Okay, we can address when we get back. Uh, 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 John, did you, is there anything you wanted to say about this or any questions you had? Recommendation number two was if recommendation number one isn't uh, approved, then if you guys wish to continue, like we've done estimates about what the revenue loss would be if we continue to the year end, uh, it would just mean a $250,000 increase to the uh, tax levy, which would be about a 0.34 increase percent in the levy. Okay. I'm sure if we compare that to the loss in businesses going out of business, it'll uh, be an interesting comparison. So I think it's good. It's one of the few things that we can do to help business get through this, other than what the federal and provincial government's doing. So I, I feel good. I feel comfortable. Well, well, you, um, but your worship, I, I didn't uh, include do. that because I, I, I didn't think that we had to uh, increase the tax levy. I thought that maybe uh, John being a new, very eager uh, ambitious accounting person might come up with a way to do it without having a tax increase. It gives them a great opportunity to impress the council and the taxpayers of the municipality. Well, the no pressure there, John. No pressure at all. 
Well, the budget that was put forth February 9th, I believe, was designed to have the rate go back up to uh, 1.25%. So, and there was also mitigation measures used uh, at the February 9th uh, um, budget uh, that was passed. So uh, we're digging into our reserves right now to help fund this. So, which are, will be needed to pay back eventually in 2022. So um, really the shortfall in revenue was hoped that uh, the tax levy could be determined uh, because the tax rates also have to be approved by the next council meeting, May 11. But the only thing about that, uh, Mr. Mayor, is that once the tax levy goes up, it never comes back down. And this is a temporary situation. So if this was something that I think was going to go on forever, I would agree with a tax increase, but not not because because it's a temporary issue. I still think we should be looking at other ways rather than, say, have an increase in taxes to cover this 250. I think that in our budget, we got to be able to find a way to cover the 250 without raising the taxes. Okay, well, John, you've been given your task. Uh, this so I'm not myself. Pushing, so I, 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 I hope Councillor Campbell agrees, but. Okay. Just, yeah, 2022 will be a, a, a challenging year, such as 2021 has been. Every year we say the same thing. This is going to be a challenging year. So just check the money tree. I think Tiffany planted a couple before she left. So go see, make sure they're doing well. And, uh, and then that's why we have reserves and that's why we have reserve stabilization funds. For and new assessments. Like this. You look at all the houses that are being completed, all the new assessment as well. Okay. Do, do I have another hand here? Who else do I have? Do I have another hand up? Ken Todd. That's, oh, that's there he's Ken. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say, uh, just to help John out here, um, you've indicated that this would go in effect to the end of September. So, uh, you know, uh, what John could do is just incorporate the difference to September. By then, uh, from September to the end of the year, uh, we'd have to report back to you and determine whether or not you want to uh, continue this past the end of September. So it really won't be September 25th, it'll be the month of September, but staff could report back, say in August, and determine uh, what the federal government's doing and, and whether you wanna continue to the year end. But he would not be able to capture those estimates because uh, the final rates uh, for taxation would already have been set. But uh, certainly we could capture the uh, difference from now into September, if, if that's what you'd like us to do. Okay. That's great. Thank you, Mr. CAO. Uh, if there's no further questions, let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Okay, moving on to item 7.6, Ontario Living Wage Network Initiative. And that Mayor. is, yes, uh, who's got, uh, counts, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Coco. Yes, I'd like to make a motion, but I have a couple of questions and a couple of comments. So in the report, it says that it's 115,000, and I did speak to John, um, that would be 0.16% increase, which is $2.07 per household. The question that I have, um, I've been communicating with Mr. Dark from Human Resources. The report says that the students are included in that dollar amount and um, they are excluded from the living wage employer. So my question is to Mr. Dart, what is the cost of the students? It's removed from the 115,000. And then I have some comments after that. Okay, uh, Mr. Dart, are you, are you there? I am oh, here. There. there you are, okay, great, welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, well, through the chair, um, Yes, Councillor Lacoco had asked me to uh, calculate the, the cost of the students. Um, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to get that in time uh, for, the, for the meeting. It is built into the $115,000. Uh, $115, uh, students are included in that calculation, along with part-time employees, uh, the arena staff, um, crossing guards, library staff. I mean... Off top of my head, I'd roughly about half, uh, uh, could be about half might be considered as students. But again, I wasn't really um, able to pull together the exact figure. 
But I think on the financial implications, there's a there's a few things to uh, to say. I think that even that hundred fifteen thousand dollars could be underestimated uh, because it's in, important to note that really that just covers uh, step one and step two. You know the direct costs only. Uh, it doesn't uh, calculate any indirect costs that might arise potentially through things like salary. Um, uh, progression or um, job evaluation. Um, it's challenging to do this because it's somewhat hypothetical, but you know, I, I, I do speculate that the impact here uh, from salary uh, compression would be fairly limited anyways. But however, the biggest concern that I see um, is I haven't been able to estimate the, uh, the cost <clears throat> of the tenders or the, uh, or the price of the external contractors. And, um, and I haven't seen any report or research or evidence from any other municipality that's able to arrive at that estimate. So unfortunately, um, that cost, you know, to be that champion level, uh, level three is, is really unknown. Councilor Coco. Okay, th thank you so much, Mr. Dark. I would like to make a motion that the city of Niagara Falls become a living wage employer. And I'll second that. Comments. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of that. Uh, and then Michael. I still do have comments as well. Okay, so we've got your motion that the city of Niagara Falls become a living wage employer. And is that a different level that you're recommending? Because there's, which no. one is that? <clears throat> to become a living wage employer, a municipality must commit to the three levels. Realistically, we're already at, at level one and level two and the, um, then you commit to being a level three within a certain date, could be three years, could be five years, but you are making that commitment. And as Mr. Dark said, sometimes there are some unknowns, but there are other municipalities that have done the same thing and they're having <coughs> issues. I do have some comments as well that can touch on some of this. Okay, just I, it's just so I can understand your motion though, because I know in the executive summary, uh, Mr. Dart says, for all intents and purposes, the city of Niagara Falls is already a living wage employer for full-time uh, permanent staff without but certification. But not certified, not certified okay. with the um, living wage. I'm sorry, the Niagara Poverty Network, I think, is the, the company. Okay. So yes, okay. technically we are doing it, but we're not certified. Um, and we're, that wouldn't mean to move, move everybody towards the 1812. What Mr. Dark is saying is that um, there's a certain high percentage of our employees that are already <clears throat> making that that amount. So my motion would be to become a certified living wage employer. Okay, so we've got your motion seconded by Councilor Iannone. And I'd um, like it recorded, please. Yep. Okay, and discussions to the motion. I had some, can I have my comment first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. go okay. ahead. You've got the Perfect. floor and then I've got Councilor Cario, Councilor Thompson, Councilor Dabrowski. Thank you. Um, I completely understand the comments and the concerns that taxpayers that this will increase uh, the tax base. I appreciate Mr. Dandy's email. He did make some good comments and concerns, and he might be right about some of his comments. Um, I don't agree that there should be a concern about comparing a CAO salary to somebody who's making $18.12 an hour. We have to start somewhere. I have considered all of these concerns, and here's where my thoughts stand. We can see from the chart it is very expensive to live in Niagara. More and more people are working for low wages. People are facing choices about buying food, paying rent, or utilities. People are working two and three jobs and working long hours just to get by. Years ago, families could comfortably live with a sole breadwinner. That is not the case anymore. I would like the city of Niagara Falls to be a leader. I want us to be confident that we are not keeping our employees in poverty. The benefits are listed in the report, but I would like to add that there will be an offset of savings because there is less turnover of employees, less absenteeism, and less health care costs because we would have happier, stable employees. I'm proud to see that the cost is not that far out because, yes, we have been, employing, been paying our employees a decent wage. The cost to each household would be $2.07. Everything we do around this council table costs money and costs our taxpayers. I'd like the city of Niagara Falls to be a role model, a leader in this, and to encourage other employees to do the same. 
It is an investment in our employees and our city, not a cost. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Coco. Then I've got Councillor uh, Cario and then uh, Thompson and then Dabrowski. Well, thank you, Your Worship. I mean, it's an admirable thing that the councillor is proposing. It's just, to me, not knowing the ramifications on our uh, subcontractors, on our tendering, um, and what happens if a, if a subcontractor isn't at this, that they could then get disqualified from tendering. Um, and not very many cities are doing this. Uh, it, it's got me a little bit scared. I, I, I'm, I'm not interested in being a leader in this particular case uh, on this particular item. I'm not suggesting that um, we, we may not get there someday, but I, I don't think that the city should be leading on this one. So I, I can't support the motion, Your Worship. It's premature, I think. Uh, and I... Um, I think that the uh, the uh, minimum wage has been set by a government uh, by the government, and uh, I, I just don't think that we're we're in a position to to do that. We don't have all the facts, so I can't support it at this time. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that. I've got Councillor Thompson and then Dabrowski. Well, I think uh, during this pandemic, municipalities are also suffering, and here we are today. They'll tax uh, water rebate for disabilities, um, the property tax interest rate, and uh, now we're talking about a, a living wage. And uh, I read with great interest Mr. Burt Dandy's letter, and I think that uh, if you're talking about uh, substantially increasing taxes with all of these decisions. Uh, we're talking about a lot of money and uh, I think we're making a mistake at this time. Uh, if it was uh, 2020 or something else, um, I could look at it, but I think we have a problem. I can't, uh, support you. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Dabrowski, then Peter Angelo. Yeah, echoing those comments, I, I do think it's a good idea. It's just not a good idea right now where, and Councillor Thompson just alluded to it, we're, we're waiving business license fees, we're, we're working on property tax, um, among other things that we're working on just to, to help the, uh, the taxpayers. Now we're talking about offering up additional money for, for salaries within the city and having that go back to the taxpayer. I just think it's it's poorly timed. Um, and Councillor Lococo mentioned, you know, setting a precedent for, for other employers. A lot of businesses that, are, that aren't open right now, and I, I hate, to, uh, hate to put the message out there that they may have to spend more on salaries just, you know, when they're just trying to open their, their doors with business in 2021. So with the pandemic, I, I just think the timing maybe could be better. We could look at this in a year. I, I just don't think this is the time that we should be looking into this at the moment. Good idea, but uh, let's be waiting a year, I don't, I don't think what would hurt. Um, and it, it'll definitely help if, if we do wait a year to, to revisit. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I just had a question in regards to the motion that is on the floor. Um, like, I know there's different levels of designation. Does the motion that's on the floor apply to uh, tendering contracts that the city would have to, um, I guess, give out tenders and ensure that the contractors that, that bid on those tenders are uh, paying the same uh, living wage standard? Maybe we can ask uh, Councillor Lococo to help it Thank understand. You, Mr. Mayor. Through the mayor. Yes, it would include all upcoming bids, um, PFQs, and um, usually what you do is make a, a spent about a living wage employer, and you, you go through it that way. Um, however, the third level is to work towards with a specific date. So, for example, I think St. Catharines did by the end of 2024. So once you register to become a living wage employer, we would do the first two. Um, so that would be level one and level two, pay everyone the 1812. And the level three, you pick the date about when that would be. So you work towards that. 
So it's not going to happen tomorrow that all of the contracts are going to change the existing ones or the new ones. You work towards a date, and that's when you start um, changing your human resource language. Uh, so there, there is a, a time period that you can work towards that. It doesn't happen right away. So, okay, and thank you for that. Um, I, I guess my question then, you worship, is uh, do we have any data on how much that's going to end up costing the city because it's a city that gives out the tenders. So if we're giving out a tender for a million dollars and and that's based on whatever wage the contract is paying and now we're saying, well, you have to have these wages, does that million dollar tender go to 1.2, 1.3? Um, do we have that type of data? Because at the end of the day, the city is the one that's going to end up paying all the increase in wages to the contractors. Um, so it, it it's the taxpayer that's gonna foot the bill for all the increased wages for not only City Hall, but also for the contractors as well, if we go down that road. I mean, I I, I, th I think the idea is, 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 is great, Your Worship, you know, let's increase everyone's wage, or let's give them more money. I just don't know that we have enough data and how it relates to the contractor side of it. Um, why wouldn't we take the first step and just, you know, kind of deal with City Hall right now, as opposed to jumping into, I guess, what I would look at as the unknown, because we really don't have any data on what it would cost us in terms of the contracts that we put up. So maybe we could get Mr. Dark, uh, if he could weigh in and see what data you actually have on external uh, contractors and things like that. Do we have any hard data at this point, Mr. Dark? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, no, we don't. Uh, that's that was the the difficulty of, of doing this report and and being able to truly understand what the financial implications are on level three. Uh, and um, you know, I, I haven't been able to find any report or evidence from other municipalities who are going down this road on what their experience or their estimate has been. I mean, it's an endeavor to get to level three, but I haven't uh, found any uh, evidence uh, either in my research from other municipalities. So it, uh, I, I can't, unfortunately, answer that question. I, I, I guess then just to follow that up, Your Worship, um, I like the idea. I want to support it. It, it. It's hard to support it without that type of data because I don't know what that's going to do to our, uh, to our budget in terms of tendering contracts. That's the difficulty for me, Your Worship. Not that I don't support the idea. Okay, thank you for that. I've got Councillor uh, Inoni and Councillor Strange with their hands up digitally. Uh, Councillor Inoni. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the idea of a living wage is to cover living expenses and food. And I'm and I'm going to use an analogy here, and it's not taking it's it's not an insult to anybody, but on tonight's in tonight's um, accounts, it's your expense check for $1,155. You get that 12 times a year. So it's $13,860 just for your expenses and not your pay. I, I, I don't have a problem with that. But people sitting at home making $15 an hour or whatever they're making, they have a problem with the group of us who appear to be entitled making comments why we would not support being a living wage employer. This is not for people to have perks. This is for people to actually be able to live and pay their food and their shelter. Um, I don't know how many times, and I'm sure your office gets calls, you deal with people privately message you saying, I can't even rent a one bedroom apartment for less than $1,600, $1,700 a month, unless it's a dump and I won't live there. We, we're in, uh, and, and I've been following all the comments in regards to how bad we are off financially and, and how we're significantly impacted by COVID. And that'll be good for the next um, topic we're talking about. But at the end of the day, we don't have to do that this in this year or next year or the year after, but we can set a target date. It's in, it's all in this, this report. And quite frankly, the first time we discussed this was January 25th, 2019, 
Like, it's not a surprise that we're bringing it back. I think we said at the time we would bring it back. So we should have that kind of information. But at the end of the day, it's not costing the taxpayers right now anymore. We're going to set a date and we're going to work towards that with our with our contractors. But quite frankly, if you're a contractor in this city building houses at the rate they're going up now, you should be paying your employees at least that amount of money, at least a living wage. So that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I've got uh, Councilor Strange. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'm, you know what? I like the initiative. I just, I just think with all of some of the unanswered questions, especially by Trent Dark, um, like I'd love to bring this back, but I, I don't think I can support it uh, tonight um, until we get all the all that data and and uh, um, find out how much it is going to cost the, the taxpayers in total and find the all the unanswered questions that. Uh, we were talking about. So I think it's great. And I think it's, it's somewhere where we could go, but I just want to get that all those unanswered questions, um, you know, from Trent before, uh, you know, I approve this tonight. Okay. Thank you for thank that. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor DeBro. Councillor DeBro. Can I go there? Is it gone? Yeah, I heard that too. Yeah. Uh, to Councillor Iononi's point, I don't, I didn't hear one person say they wouldn't support it. I, I just, I don't feel comfortable with our director of human resources telling us as a council that he's unsure what this might cost the taxpayer and making a shotgun decision tonight rather than wait a month or maybe two months to get a full report back to see what the cost implications would be to the taxpayer. And then we can make an informed decision at that time. But making the decision tonight without the numbers in front of us would be irresponsible and it won't get us further ahead. I think it would be making a decision quickly just so we can say that we're a living wage employer i like to wait a month or two i'd like to give the director of human resources the opportunity to get the information and answer some of the questions that our fellow council members tonight have had and then we can make an informed decision at that time but just to clarify i didn't say i wouldn't support it i just don't think it's good timing today okay thank you i've got councillor lococo then councillor Cario. thank you mr mayor um i I appreciate everyone's comments. I'm not sure what a month is going to do. I don't know if Mr. Dark is going to be able to get that information. Uh, maybe we can ask him, but my understanding is uh, this is a new venture for many municipalities and it's a commitment that you're signing for, uh, for whatever number of years. Um, so it is very difficult to get that. And I don't want to see us say, if we decide to come back in a month, where are we going to get that data? Um, so if if we're unable to get the data, we're going to be in the same place. We need to uh, put a step forward and be a leader in our community and ensure that our families are not living in poverty. Motion is on the floor and if I'll see how it goes and then after that I might have another motion. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Kirio. Your Worship, I'd just like to say, we, if we're gonna go forward, we really should have some input from the other people that we're going to affect. You're going to affect other businesses, other people that tender in the municipality. We don't know the financial impact on their businesses or whether or not we would be eliminating some of them if they can't afford to change their wages on their ability to tender with our municipality. But what's the hurry? Why, why, why would we move forward with something where we don't know the financial implications on people that we're asking to be involved? I don't get the, I don't get the rush, but anyway, um, that's my opinion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Councillor. You don't get the rush because you can pay your mortgage and you can pay your rent and you can pay your your expenses. There are people in this city who cannot do that on the wage they're making right now, Vince. And lucky you and all of us sitting at around this table that we can. But we represent more than more than the upper echelon and the people who are hurting want to see us make a decision. I don't think it's a rush. I don't think it's, but I think listening to a rich hotel owner say, what is the hurry is really hypocritical. Well, if, if I may answer that question, your worship, Councilor yeah. Ryan has no idea on who can afford to pay what during two years of the pandemic. I think that you're dreaming if you think that just because 
you think you know about other people's financial positions, you don't have a clue. Mr. Okay. Mayor. Thank you. Can yes, that's not, can we not talk personal about anybody no. though? I apologize, but I will say this. We're going to discuss the downtown BIA next. Um, it was a shotgun decision to take them to double their taxes, which is contrary. Can we, to can we just stay to this, Councillor? We're, we're dealing with living wage right now, though. Mr. Witt, I get that. But when you say that we do not understand other people's ability on how to pay, that's what we are getting emails about every single day from downtown business owners, and they're being ignored. So I, I think if that's the if that's the the reality of it, we better keep that in mind for every everything and not just this. Okay, I've got Wayne Camp, Councillor Campbell and Councillor Peter Angelo. Thank you, Your Worship. Could, uh, can we reread the motion? Uh, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll ask our clerk if you would please reread it. Here, Your, Your Worship, uh, the motion is simply that the City of Niagara Falls become a certified living wage employer. Uh, thank you. I, I have to support that. I mean, we got to start someplace and we can continue to gather statistics, information as we go along, but we got to start someplace. And if it's simply the city of Niagara Falls being an example of, of living wage payments, we should be supporting that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I, I, I think I've heard pretty much every single person say that they support the idea. So what I was going to see was, I mean, can we compromise and say that, um, you know, we'll go for the designation of the city being a living wage employer first. And in the meantime, we'll try to analyze what some of the statistics would be in terms of our tendering contracts and how much more that would, uh, I guess, impact our tax base. And then we can shoot for that next level after. But perhaps as a compromise, is it possible for just the city, like City Hall, to get that designation first? And then we and then we try to go to the next level. I think it would be a decent compromise, Your Worship. Okay, so well, that's something we'd have to go back to the mover on to see I know. if they were willing to compromise. Uh, Councillor Lacoco, did you? Want, I've got you, Councillor Ianoni. Councillor Lacoco, did you want to uh, comment on that suggestion for the motion? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The designation is a signed commitment with the Ontario Poverty Reduction Network. I think that's what it's called. Um, so we could, we as a city could say we are paying a living wage, but we couldn't say we're a living wage employer unless you are in um, a commitment with the Niagara Poverty Network. So um, it is to sign for eighteen twelve an hour for our uh, city employees, full-time and part-time, those are the first two levels, and you commit by a certain date. So we can pick that date, whether it's the end of 2024, 2025, but you cannot sign up to be a living wa wage employer without that commitment to get to level three champion. So it, it's not something that can just say, yes, we are. I see, and, 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 that, level, and that level three then applies to any tender that the city would put out after? Yes, through the chair, it would apply to all of those tenders, um, any P PFQs, um, anything like that. But you have that time to work towards uh, working with specific people to ensure um, that they are living wage employers. And wh when a municipality becomes a living wage employer, it is a, it's a, it's a great big deal. Um, there, there are... Um, there's a lot of responsibility, but there's a, a lot of benefits that go with it. Once you become a living wage employer, you, you campaign to other people, other businesses within your community. It's not that you have, you're telling them they have to, but they can start to see the benefits. You have let, less people who are absent, absent from work. Um, you have less turnover. You have happier employees. There's a lot of benefits that go to it. And usually when a municipality becomes a living wage employer, they promote that and uh, you get better applications for people wanting to work there. There's a lot of benefits that go to it, let alone talking about our employees, about how much we can better their lives. So it is a commitment, but we cannot be level one or level two without signing up with a date for level three. And through you again, Your Worship, if I can, I just have another question. Um, yep. The time frame that you're allowed to complete this in and also 
are you allowed to go to different levels of pay in different years until you actually reach that designation? Because I think maybe layering it um, might be, uh, I, I guess, not as impactful. Through okay, yeah, chair, go ahead, Councillor. Yeah. Through, through the chair, um, what I understand is um, for this one that we're looking at, it would be the 115000 as Mr. Dark outlined, and that's $2.07 per taxpayer per household. Um, so if we were to look at something like that, I don't really understand what the benefit would be to layer it. Um, the 1812 is based specifically about Niagara Falls. If you look at uh, Hamilton, it has a different rate. You look at um, a city in BC or Nova Scotia, it's how much it costs to live within there. So yes, that will be amended. Uh, they amended at different times of uh, every couple of years, but we cannot layer it in different, um, different years. And how, however, they will not be monitoring. It, it's it's a commitment that our city has committed to do, and we will work towards that. Um, if it's something that just falls apart because of the economy, those are things that we talk to to the organization for. But we are committed to. It's just like a, a green initiative or um, our, our employment lands. You have a specific goal in mind and you have to work towards it. You don't know what all of the ramifications are going to be when you decide that you're going to be a green uh, green city or a bee pollinator city. A lot of times there are ideas, you have to start, you do as much research as you can and you put your step, step forward and you go with it. Yes, there's going to be some unknowns, but there's a lot of municipalities that are in the same boat as us and we want to do it. So we can pick a date and work towards it, but that 115,000, I think we can, that would be very easy to do and sign a commitment letter. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you, I've got Captain, uh, Councillor Strange, Councillor Cario. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And and again, like I, I, I like the initiative. I just think the timing is, is all wrong right now. And I would just love to get some answers back from our director of human resources about the exact impact, whether it's our tenders or um, the tax levy or whatever it is that he needs to get back to us before we uh, approve this. Thank you for that. Thank you for uh, that. Uh, Councillor Kerry. Uh, quick then, one, Mr. Dark is not suggesting that. He's suggesting that the 115 is light. I thought that's what Mr. Dark said, that he, he thinks that the, the 115 is underestimated. So it might be more than that. Anyway, that's, well. Mr. Dark, can you just confirm that, that you're, uh, the number you're not certain that's the high end? Well, the 115 really is the, uh, the cost for our part-time staff, really, uh, you know, to, to become a living wage, right? Um, the, um, but you're, yeah, I mean, I, I can't, I can't estimate the cost of level three. So I assume there is a cost. Uh, so I, you know, 115 is probably not the entire um, true cost of this, I guess. That's what I'm saying. Okay, thank you for that. I've got. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Uh, on that point, again, Mr. Dark said uh, that the 115 did not, did include the students the program excludes students. Mr. Dark said that the students were half, so we're not even talking the 115 could be reduced if we don't include students, which is not the expectation in the program. Mr. Dark, yeah. Uh, yeah, that is true. Uh, it, it, it does include uh, students in that estimate. Um, but again, I it cannot estimate level three. And part of this, as Councilor Lococo says, is making that commitment to get to level three and unfortunately, right now, I do not have any estimate of what that, those costs would be. So, Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so, sorry, I'm kind of, uh, uh, Councillor Thompson and then Iannone. Yeah, if we're talking 2024, um, why won't we get a report back? If I've never seen um, a, a, an issue like this and you don't know the financial details. We have to know that, and it's going to affect the municipality and all the decision we're making here now. Uh, somebody said, what, three point something 
percent uh, from the two percent for this year. Um, we got to have the information. There's nothing wrong with paying people the appropriate wage, but um, we have to know because we're responsible for taxes and for people in the community. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Iannone? No? Okay, uh, is there anybody else that wishes to uh, weigh in? Co Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. There's no better time than right now to make these decisions. If we were to say between now and 2024, 2025, we're going to get the data before we make that final commitment. But I, all I'm saying is the city of Niagara Falls should be a leader in this movement. And it's not going to cost us any money, a significant amount of money in the initial stages. But between now and 2024, we can gather information and we might find it's really easy to make things happen after that. Or we might find it's not a good decision on behalf of the uh, taxpayer and we can walk away. But we got to start someplace. Are you suggesting that uh, an <coughs> annual increase is not going to be expected by everybody involved? Absolutely, they are. How, how do you mean annual increase? Folks, can you just speak through me, though, please, so we your, can control this? Your, I want to ask the question. We're only talking about how much money was that that's going to cost us? Nobody knows. $2 a household yeah. per year? Am I correct? $2 and pennies a year? Is that what the estimate is at this point? Come on, you spend that much money daily on a coffee. Okay. Any other comments of council? Yes, Councilor Dabrowski. Just quickly, I, I we don't have all of the information in front of us. It sounds like there's been a lot of questions around the table, and Mr. Dark, <clears throat> I, I know you know he he knows all things human resources, but he doesn't have the information we're looking for in front of him right now. So again, I would support it, but I'd like to see a, a report come back, whether it be in a month or two, and then vote on that appropriately. Okay, seeing that there's no other comments, I'll weigh in too, especially since it's going to be a recorded vote. At this time, this motion I will not support. I do support the idea, not the way it's being presented. Uh, too many questions, not enough answers. I'll give an example. What I'm struggling to understand is how the heck could City of Hamilton have a living wage $16.45 when we're 18 and 12 and they're Everything's more expensive in Hamilton. Property's quite a bit more expensive. I don't understand that. Even Waterloo is even cheaper yet, 1635. Seems like there's not a lot of consistency between municipalities. That's the concern. The fact that only five cities in Ontario have signed on, that's another concern. And I agree that people deserve to have it. This timing could not be worse, in my opinion. We're, we're begging the government for wage subsidies so businesses can hang on and including this city getting subsidies from other levels of government. And at the end of the day, we always say there's one taxpayer. So we're asking them to subsidize now. Well, we're not sure what businesses are gonna hang around. And, and it may be $2 to some taxpayers, it'll be a lot more to others. And the ones that are hurting the most right now, I, I like the idea of going down and having this discussion. I don't like the idea of committing to a bill that I don't know what it's gonna be until I get it. I'd never do that in business. I'd never do that with somebody else's money. And I'm not comfortable with, with that type of thing. So uh, for that reason, I'm not gonna be able to support this, but I wanna be able to support it, but not like this. So I guess, uh, Mr. Uh, Clerk, we can call the vote. Uh, yes, yeah, so as stated earlier, the motion is that the city of Niagara Falls become a certified living wage employer. And we'll start alphabetically, Councillor Campbell. Question. Can we Can add, we add 20, 20, 24 to the motion? To the motion? Folks, you're going to have to unmute. Mute. 
You're going to have to mute your lines and unmute one at a time, please, because we're going to have echoes. Go ahead, Councillor Campbell. I asked the question, can we include the date by 2024 in the motion? And it, during that process, we will gather the inf necessary information to say yes or no in 2024. We can ask the mover of the motion. Yes. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I would be accepting of that amendment because that's basically what it is. It's just putting it in the motion. And I assume the seconder is good with that too, Councilor Idoni? Yep. I'm in favor. So, can I just get a clarification on the actual motion, Mr. Mayor? Yes, you could. Mr. Mayor, so yes, the motion is that the city of Niagara Falls become a living wage employer by December 31st, 2024, period. And an explanation of what a living wage employer is, is that we would pay full-time and part-time staff eighteen twelve an hour, and that we work towards the level three of champion to include third-party contractors, bidders, etc. Right, and 1812 is the number this year. That'll change each year. Correct, correct. Councilor Dabrowski, you had a question? No, I'm good. Okay. Oh, sorry, sorry uh, Mr. Yeah. Dark. Yeah. Yeah, I just uh, want to make the point that um, if the the motion indicates that we're going to apply for certification that's my understanding and with that is a commitment that we are going to move to the champion status by 24 which also means that um we're going to would be start amending our tenders accordingly is that am i right about that Councillor Lacoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In my conversations with the organization, there is no specific, oh, within two weeks, you have to start amending your documents. You're working towards, and they put the faith in you that you are working towards it. So there's no specific time. You can do research. You can talk with people. You can do the implementation. It's all up to us on how we get there, but we have to put our, um, it's in good faith that we do it. But it's got to be done by 2024. Whatever date we, we say, that's not their date. We can pick a date. You did. Mr. Dark, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Clerk. Okay. The previous motion that I read off as amended, we have Councillor Campbell in favor. Next, Councillor Dabrowski. Uh, against until I have more info. I'm marking that as opposed. Councillor Iannone. Thank you. In favor. Councillor Cario. Opposed. Councillor Lococo. In favor. Councillor Peter Angelo. No, you are she. Councillor Strange. Uh, opposed until I have more info. Councillor Thompson. Um, I, I would support it when there's the documentation and the uh, information that we need. So, no. Marking that as opposed, Mayor Diodati. Opposed. That motion is defeated. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to yep. put another motion forward then. My okay, motion would be that the City of Niagara Falls pay a living wage of 1812 to our full-time and part-time employees. And um, staff come back with a report in a month with further information that would allow us to make a decision becoming a certified living employer. I would second that and I'd like to make a comment. Uh, just some clarity first, uh, Councillor Lococo. Now you're saying 1812. I know you don't want us to lower the wage of our employees because our 
full-time people already make more than 1812. So yes. what you're talking about is just the part-time employees. Anyone making less than 1812, it, whether they're full-time or part-time to be raised to 1812. And if it was over 1812, they still keep their salary. Okay. And excluding concern, students, sorry, exclude, that excludes, exclu excluding the students. And my concern and the reason why I'm putting it forward this way is I, I don't think um, human resources is going to be able to come back in a month with those, with that information. It, it's information that is very hard to get because it's a new program. Um, if Mr. Dark can go and talk to our contractors and have those discussions, but I don't see that that information is going to be able to come back. So this is why I'm putting this. Yes, we can say we're, we are paying a living wage. We won't be a certified living wage employer. And let's come back in a month with the information and then we can have the discussion again. Okay, and I'm just gonna yeah. ask uh, Mr. Dark, a month seems like a pretty tight timeline. I don't know if that's reasonable or realistic. Mr. Dark, what, what in your opinion, what amount of time would you need? Well, through the chair, um, I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to be able to have that information on level three, if that is what the uh, motion entails. Getting the costs of the uh, part-time staff is probably achievable, um, but the, the, the other aspect of this is getting that information on the contractors. Uh, I'm not going to be really realistically be able to pull that together in a month's time if that's what uh, the expectation is. And um, frankly, the, the five municipalities that have become living wage employers, I haven't seen any evidence that they have that re done that research or it's in any report that I've seen. So I still need to maybe talk to, to them and see what uh, analysis, financial implications they have done on, uh, on moving towards certification. That's gonna take some time. Otherwise, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really going to be able to gather a lot of this information because, frankly, the external contractors, they're private companies and, you know, they're not going to necessarily provide this information to me. So it's a, it's a tough task is what I'm saying. Okay. So I just want to suggest, and I, and I see, I go, I know lots of hands. I just, before we even get to that point, Councilor Coco, I, I think the concern is going to be around the timing of next month. I don't want you to set yourself up for failure because it's obvious that's a huge job. And right now staff are, I know it's a little weird that the time right now, but I can tell you they're taxed beyond one day where they're taking down playground equipment. Next day, they're putting it back up. Like it's been, they've been really overwhelmed. So maybe you want to just think about revising that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I only said a month after I heard a month, a couple of times in this conversation, my point is that, that information is going to be very, very difficult to get. And whether we postpone this a month, two months, three months, I think we're going to have the same conversation. It's very difficult to get that information. It's private contractors, you have to take a leap of faith. There's other municipalities doing it. And that that's why I only brought up a month because other people suggested a month. We can, we can amend that if you'd like, but I really don't think there's going to be much information to show you what contractors um, what the extent of that is. Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, okay, I've got Councillor Anoni. Yep. To that point, um, on June 25th, it'll be two years ago that we had almost this same discussion and it was, we received and filed it. So there's been two years and then a motion at the last meeting to gather information. Um, I don't think a month is gonna do anything. I don't think they're gonna find any more information that, in a month. Um, I've watched the other council meeting um, videos when they've they've become a living wage city, and they're pretty much just trying to make sure that the most vulnerable in their community are making at most a living wage. And I don't think that's too much to ask. I just don't think you're going to get any more information. It's been two years since this last discussion, and we're no farther along today than we were two years ago. Well, of course not, because we received and filed it. We didn't ask staff to look into it. So, of course, we did what staff did what they were asked to do. Mr. Mayor, you could pull that tape again. We It's pretty much the same conversation we've had today. We don't know what it would cost. Um, it, there's a lot of unknowns. We weren't prepared to do it at the time. We pretty much had the same conversation. The only difference was there was no vote to do it. Okay. So we've got other uh, feedback. of Councillor uh, Campbell, with your hand up digitally. Well, yes. 
Your Worship. Um, let me suggest that it be 12 months for a report to come back. And then depending on the outcome of the report, we could make it a, a, an election issue. Okay. Oh, I have no doubt it's already an election issue, Councillor Campbell. Did we have, I saw some, we had some hands earlier to weigh in. I've got Councillor Cario. Oh yeah, there you are. And then Councillor Dabrowski. Thank you, Worship. Um, I'd like to see a notification to people that tender um, contracts for the city. I'd like to see them notified that Niagara Falls is considering becoming a uh, uh, this this uh, wage um, living wage municipality and have them comment. I don't like to impose uh, a minimum wage on another company and not have them notified. So that's one of the other reasons I did not want to support that tonight. I'm, I don't want to make a decision based on other companies' minimum wages without having them notified and having them had the opportunity uh, to come to council and make their pitch. We've got people coming to council tonight to make a pitch on things that they've got no business doing. And we don't even going to ask uh, people that could be adversely affected by what we do uh, to give their comments on this. So I think that they need to be notified and said, maybe uh, get back to the city and, and say what uh, impact that would have on their business, what impact that would have on their tendering. And then are, are we also, does this also include where we buy products? Does it include that we only buy products from people who pay a living wage or is it just tendering? Uh, but anyway, anyone that's affected should be notified. Where's the openness and transparency in this? Uh, I don't want to be someone that just changes someone's pay level or what they have to pay their people and they, whether they do read it in the newspaper or uh, read it on the, or listen to it on the radio. So they need to be notified. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dabrowski. Yeah, just uh, we keep on going in circles with the same topic. And I heard the words leap of faith. I won't make any financial decisions on a leap of faith. And uh, I understand the, the point that we want to be a leader. And being a leader doesn't necessarily mean we're being first. I think we should do our due diligence. I think we should be responsible, get, get you know, receive the info from our director of human resources, who, again, doesn't have all of the answers in front of them. And I don't mind waiting a month or two months or three months or however long it takes Mr. Dart to get back to us with that information um, to make a fully informed decision from there. So I'll leave it at that. Now, procedurally, I've got a question for the clerk, and I don't know that he'll have the answer and uh, our CAO may need to weigh in, even maybe our solicitor. Is this a motion for reconsideration? Because we're not calling it, um, we're not calling it the same Ontario living wage. We're calling it $18.12. So I'm just wondering uh, if we could just get maybe some input from our clerk or our solicitor or our CAO, just to make sure we're not walking ourselves into some procedural challenges. So I don't know, Mr. Uh, Lustick or Todd or Matson, anyone wants to weigh in? Are you guys still there? Mr. Mayor, I'll withdraw my motion. Your Worship, can I just ask a question while uh, while they're thinking? I guess um, well, the motion's been withdrawn, Councillor. But yeah, okay. But the motion that was on the floor was simply that the city of Niagara Falls pay a living wage, and that would pertain to the was it the hundred and fifty thousand dollars that was in the report? Well, why don't we ask the mover? Yeah, Councillor Coco. If we wanted to include the students, that would be the hundred and fifty. Thousand. If you take the students out, it would be less than that. Does that answer your question, Councillor? It does, and and I would be comfortable again with the city of Niagara Falls taking that step. Um, I think it's the unknown that 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 scares a lot of us um, because we really don't have the data to support it. Uh, there's a lot of questions that are unanswered, but again, I think you heard from every single person that they want to support the idea. So, I mean, I don't know if it is reconsideration, um, but if we could, like, if we could land on the city of Niagara Falls, having that status, becoming a living wage employer, I would be comfortable with that. 
And and I can just say, I it's the it's the part two that concerns me. I I like the idea. It's the what comes behind it, and especially it's unknown. A lot of it's unknown. We don't know. And I don't like the argument. Other municipalities are doing it. <laughs> Other municipalities are not doing it. I mean that that to me is irrelevant. I want to do what we're going to do. We're leaders. We're not followers. So I'd rather us lead. So I've got Councillor Lacoco and Councillor Kim. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I understand the idea about other municipalities. The statement that I made was that they were able to do it because they um, they, they, they talked with different contractors. They, they have some sort of um, idea about what it's going to take to move forward. This information is all new. I, I really don't feel that Mr. Dark is going to be able to get any more information today, three months from now, four months from now. And I just feel that if we wait till that, it, it's not going to happen. So um, I did withdraw my motion. If if we would like to pay 18, 12 for our full-time and, and part-time um, employees, then we can move towards that. If it's reconsideration, then no. Um, I myself will do a, a lot of investigation to see if I can find information from other municipalities because they, they were able to do that. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, yeah. Councillor Campbell. Yes, Your Worship, the motion does not include part two and part three. I understand the motion that the city of Niagara Falls is going to start a living wage program. And we're going to deal with the people that do service work for us over the period of time, whether it be 12 months or 24 months. The point is the motion does not include, and correct me, Lori, if I'm wrong, it doesn't include stage two and stage three. It simply said, we're gonna be a living wage employee. Employer. Employer. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry, I'll just clarify that. It was to pay 1812 to the full-time and part-time, which is level one and level two. So just to change that, it is level two, because that's part-time employees. Okay, um, I'm not sure who I've got right now. Did someone else have their hand up? No? I did, but I, if the motion's withdrawn, then there's no point going on. With is it reconsideration, Mr. Mayor? I don't know, that's why I was waiting. I'm still, I, I still haven't seen the CAO, I haven't seen our solicitor. Oh, here we go. We got the clerk, he's gonna wait. Through your worship, the procedural bylaw does speak to uh, motions to reconsider, and then the section that talks about um, reconsideration rule shall not apply to the following. A motion that, while pertaining to a previously decided motion, does not alter the core purpose or intent of the previously decided motion. So I guess we have to answer the question, does this new motion alter the core purpose or intent of the previously decided motion? No. So did you want to answer the question? Well, uh, to me, they're very similar, but um, I don't know if that's for me to decide. Uh, to me, it sounds like it is, you know, if we're talking about two thirds of the motion going through, it sounds to me like it's very similar. So, so just a suggestion here. I mean, even if it's a motion for reconsideration, we can address it. You need two thirds majority. So it doesn't negate it. What I'm saying is if you can get something that everyone's agreeable to, you know, better to get, I think, get a partial victory. You know, I mean, if you've got a chance that you know what people are willing to support, and it's pretty, I think it's obvious, Councilor Coco, that the council is not comfortable supporting the unknown going forward. Uh, all the assurances in the world, they're not comfortable with that. So I think you can pick up on maybe what's palatable, and what might work. And and if we have to do a motion for reconsideration, well, then we, we could do that. So, Councilor, I got Councilor Coco, and then, uh, okay, Councilor Coco. Okay, Mr. Mayor. Um if this motion is acceptable, then if we would reconsider it, I'll put this on the floor, that the city of Niagara Falls pay 1812, which is considered a living wage to our part-time and, and uh, part-time and full-time employees. 
and have our staff and counselors get more information to come back within six months to revisit the living wage employer designation. I would second that. Okay, so I'm gonna ask our, our, clerk, sorry, our clerk to weigh in on that. So th that motion is great, but let's first get that motion to reconsider. And the procedural bylaw does state that that motion for reconsideration should be uh, voted on, uh, or actually it should be moved and seconded by councillors that voted with the majority. So we would need uh, councillors that were in, in opposition to that motion earlier uh, to be the ones to move and second that proposed motion that councillor Lococo just read out. I'll move the reconsideration. Okay, we've got a motion. We've got a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, uh, second, second by, by Councillor Strange. Okay, that this matter be reconsidered. Okay, so if there's no discussion to this, we'll call the vote. This is just to reconsider it, and then we'll have the vote on the next motion if this is successful with two thirds. Your All Worship, those... can we have a recorded vote? Mr. Uh, don't know that we're going to need one, but Mr. Uh, Clerk? No, we don't need one. Hey, hey so for the speaking on this. The motion to reconsider. Sorry, I didn't hear that. What was that, Councillor? I didn't hear you. There's no discussion. No, no, no. I said I didn't know that we would need an in, uh, a recorded vote. I think this is no. going to be fine. Uh, Councillor Thompson was... Starting okay. to okay. I can't agree with this. Okay, no problem. Okay, oh, Mr. Clark. I, no, no, we're good. I, we're good. I'm okay with this. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so for a recorded vote for the motion to reconsider, Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Dabrowski. Or Councillor Iononi. In favor. Councillor Curio. In favor. Councillor Lococo? In favor. Councillor Peter Angelo? Yes. Councillor Strange? Strange? In favor. Councillor Thompson? Yes. Mayor Diodati? Yes. And that uh, carries unanimously. Okay, so Councillor Lococo, did you want to put your motion on the floor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that the City of Niagara Falls pay eighteen twelve an hour to our part time and full time employees. Second. And minimum, that minimum. Mi minimum, sorry. <laughs> a minimum of 18 to 12 for, for the full time and part time employees, which is considered a living wage. And that staff within six months bring more information back on how we could achieve to be a living wage employer. Okay. And we've got a motion by Councillor Lococo, second by Councillor Iononi. And I just want to point out a living wage according to the Ontario Living Wage Network. Right. This is the group that determines that, not the city or, or, or the province. It's this, Correct, this group. Yes. And I've got Councillor Cario. Yep. Uh, how, could we ask uh, Mr. Dark how many employees this affects? Obviously, doesn't affect any full time employees. No. Would it affect part time employees and uh, summer mm -hmm. students only, Mr. Dark? Uh, Mr. Dark? Yep. Yeah, uh, through the chair, it would include uh, like the. Uh, arena staff, uh, crossing guards, uh, library staff. Um, uh, I, I don't have the exact number of people, but um, it, you know, it, they're all embedded in that cost of 115,000 less the student cost. Okay, okay. So um, before we vote on it, before I vote on it, I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that in many cases, uh, services, city hall has been closed. People have been working from home. I don't know exactly how many uh, services were affected or how many services that we did not provide over the last uh, time during the pandemic. And the optics are, this has all been going on and we are gonna decide to give the employees a raise. That is, am I correct in that? Uh, who, are you no. ask, who are you asking that question of, Councillor Kirill? Sorry. Uh, anybody, like any staff that can answer, uh, Mr. Dark, Mr. Todd, uh, you know. 
Well, uh, yeah, that would be a raise in some cases. For sure it would be. I mean, there some people are below 1812 at the moment. Yeah, yeah. and in the case of, you suggest the library, uh, they have been closed and they have been working from home. Is that correct? I believe so. Okay, thanks. Okay, I've got Councillor Dabrowski and then the Coco. Yeah, again, we're, we're making the motion and voting on it, but how many people, and maybe Mr. Dark can, can answer, but how many people will this affect under that $18 an hour mark? If he could answer that, he might not have the, the number in I front know. of him, but I'm just curious to know how many people this does affect, because full-time employees, of course, Mr. Mayor, you mentioned it probably um, make more than the 1812. I, I just want to know or have some sort of indication on what exactly are, are we talking about here? How many people are we affecting? Etc. Yeah, Mr. Clark, Dirk, do you have any uh, any numbers that can help us? I know it's tough. To, uh, we're asking you on the fly. It's tough. I yeah, know we have sorry, I don't and, have the exact numbers. Again, they're they're part of that one hundred and fifteen thousand dollar cost, less the students. If if um, you take out the student calculation, you know it's it's it you know it could be half the cost of the one hundred and fifteen. But in terms of the number of people, I don't have that information handy for you. You can get that and produce that at next meeting if you want. And that, that answers my question. And we're going around in circles and we maybe could have voted on having our staff report back. But I'd be more comfortable voting on this if I had the numbers, how many people were impacted, how many people were affected before I make an informed decision. It's odd that we're, we're making a motion um, relating to finances without the, the information readily available in front of us. I, at least I feel that way. A question for Councillor Coco. Um, I know you want to, I know you're anxious to get this done. Uh, any thought to having staff come back with an exact number for our next meeting with um, this motion that you have there, almost acting as a notice of motion with those exact numbers? I don't know. It's it, it calls yours, but um, again, it's just hard when our staff don't even know the numbers that we're gonna. Uh, we're going to vote on something that's going to be perpetual. So I don't know. I'll leave it with you. You're the move of the motion. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My concern is that this was brought up almost two years ago and we um, brought it to staff. No disrespect to staff. It was brought to staff to bring up these numbers. Um, and, and I would expect that those numbers would have been in the report. I understand that there's lots of things going on with COVID. Maybe they didn't make it. There's, there's lots of reasons. Um, my concern is if we we just keep postponing it postponing it we know it's at a maximum of 115,000 we've been told that it's it would go down half if we excluded the students whether that affects five people 100 people we don't know but that's why we asked for the report so here we are asking for the report we know that i think we need to make a move to state to our employees and to the city that we live in in our community that we are paying our employees a living wage so they are not in poverty we can work towards the designation later on and it, this is a good news story we need to promote this and um Councilor Rio brought up about our tenders maybe that's something that we can be working with our business development is maybe do a survey and and ask them questions and and get some information um I just don't want to come back in a month, two months, three months, however long it is, and be in the same position we are today. Okay, <laughs> Councillor Dabrowski. Uh, Mr. Dart, for you to Councillor Lakoka, he mentioned that he could have that report back in a month. I'd be more comfortable voting on it in a month. We don't know how many people it affects. We don't have an actual or an exact number. I don't think a, a month will, will affect um, this negatively. And you mentioned COVID and Mayor Giordani mentioned it. We did receive a file this two years ago and lots is going on with the pandemic. As you mentioned, businesses were closed. So kudos to staff for, for keeping positive and getting the work done. But I would like to afford Mr. Dark the, the opportunity to come back with that report in a month. I think it's a lot less cumbersome than the, the full report that we were asking for that you were requesting earlier. And then I'd be more comfortable voting on this motion. But by the way, we keep saying we keep saying a month. Vote, Mr. Mayor, you want to call the vote? Yes, please. Okay, so we've got a motion to call the vote. Uh, do we have a second to call the vote? Somebody else going to support that, Councillor Iannone? Okay. Do you want a recorded vote, Councillor Coco? Yes, please. 
Okay, Mr. Clerk. And by the way, for the record, everyone, we keep saying a month. The next meeting is May 11th. It's in less than three weeks. Three weeks. Okay. I okay, recorded vote on the latest motion. Councillor Campbell. In favor. Councillor Dabrowski. Again. Councillor Iannone. In favor. Councillor Cario. I think Councillor Cario may have frozen there. I'm going to yeah, move on. Oh, there he's back. He's oh, back. He's opposed. Back. Opposed. Thank you. Councillor Lococo. Sorry, in favor. Councillor Peter Angelo. Yes. Councillor Strange. Uh, in favor. Councillor Thompson. Thompson. Yes, yes. And Mayor Duhaddy. All support it. And that uh, motion carries. Okay, thank you for that. So we go from one fun one to the next one. 7.7 7, HR 2021 City Council Training. So, Mr. Dark, this is this is your report. Um, did you have anything you wanted to say to it? Uh, yes, uh, through the mayor, um, March second meeting, uh, staff were asked to come back and and do a report uh, on a information or education session uh, on the uh, code of conduct and team building. Um, and I think there might have been some suggestion to include sensitivity training on that. So what we did in this report is we provided some training options um, and view this as a kind of a positive first step on identifying uh, and discussing uh, examples on individuals' own behaviors and actions that can impact others and the uh, performance of counsel. Um, I, the intent of the training would be to be inclusive and participatory and really focus in on some of the key elements of team building like respect, trust, um, communication and awareness, self-awareness. Um, at the same time, um, we've also included, um, you know, a better understanding of the legislative obligations around the code of conduct, which would cover uh, through the integrity commissioner going over a number of important items for, for council members like staff relations, social media, uh, respectful um, behaviors, workplace harassment. Um, and um, the training really would be a, um, in part of facilitated discussion and dialogue and hopefully coming out with some uh, shared understanding of how we are going forward how uh, we work together as a team inside and outside the uh, the chambers. Um, it's not intended to be a, uh, a diagnosis or a, 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 a lay blame or cast aspersions on anyone or any individual or any members of the team. So uh, um, we, uh, we think uh, the having ADR chambers involved uh, is a, a really good option because they are the integrity commissioners and they can also uh, have experience with uh, mediation and uh, I suppose if uh, council desires we can also look at uh, more uh, down the road more customized or intensive uh, mediated solution but um, so uh, we're just looking we're just looking for the feedback and uh, we're trying to comply with the uh, the wishes of council yeah, looking for the direction. Can't hear you, Jim. Councilor Peter Angel, is your hand up? It is, Your Worship. Yes, thank you. Um, Your Worship, I had made the motion originally. Um, uh, so I, I guess I want to just start off by saying thank you to staff uh, for bringing the report back. I do like the report because it does give us a few different options. Um, my preference, Your Worship, would be uh, option number three, which would include... Um, you know, both ADR and, you know, uh, someone else that is speaking to council. I, 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 I think having 
ADR speak to us would, uh, you know, allow members of council to perhaps uh, address some of the more uh, technical questions that they would like to ask and, uh, and get some good feedback. And then the other side of it, Your Worship, kind of brings me back to, uh, you know, we, we used to start a council term um, having someone speak to us. And I remember in the past that uh, I think two or three times it was George Cuff. And George Cuff would come and he would speak to us and, and he would, you know, tell council what their responsibilities are, um, how to respect one another. Some of the interesting things that he would talk about is, you know, how you come back together after you go through a very difficult vote or how you come back together after you feel that you've, you know, perhaps been wronged by someone. And I mean, to me, that's important because uh, I do feel a bit of distance, um, you know, is, is, is present uh, among some. So, and I won't say all, but, um, but I do feel that presence. Um, so for me, I think I would like option number three uh, and it doesn't have to be a one and done. Um, you know, I mean, professional development is something that organizations, you know, take on regularly. It, 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 it doesn't have to be once every four years. So I'd like to start with option number three. And then, you know, as we reconvene with council, you know, we can decide whether or not we want to do something more after that. So that would be my preference, Your Worship, and that would be my motion. Okay, so motion by Councillor Peter Angel that we go up option three, the hybrid code of conduct and team building, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. Okay, so we've got a motion on the floor. I've got Councillor Iannone and then Councillor Cario. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to vote against the motion. I think that Mr. Dark just said we could come back and have a customized, integral, mediated solution. I think we need that now. Um, I think Councillor Peter Angelo was doing good until he said that it was amongst some had disagreements, kind of uh, singling out people. There's no, there's no mistake where the problems are here. I think we need far more than a two-hour solution. Um, by the way, Councillor Peter Angelo, we did do that same session this term. We had Janet Leeper and. Um, Mr. Halinski from Aird and Bearless, who sat with us, and I think we actually put four or five hours into that session where they explained to us code of conduct, how we should be treating each other, how we should be treating staff, how they walked through the sessions with us. We did that. And two and a half years later, we're right back where we are right now. I don't think a two hour solution with Mr. McDermott, who has investigated me more times than I can count, and others around this table, they already know what they're coming into. We're broken. And I do not think a two hour session will fix that. I think we need something far deeper than that. Okay, thank you, Councillor uh, uh, Cario, and then Peter Your Worship. Angelo. Yeah, go Your ahead, Worship, yeah. yeah, just on that point, could I have Mr. Dark just clarify that it's not actually a two hour session with Mr. McDermott. I believe it's a, it's a one hour with Mr. McDermott and then one hour with someone else. And perhaps, uh, Mr. Dark, if you can just explain that. Mr. Dark? Yeah, that, sorry, through the chair. Yeah, that's correct. The, the first hour was uh, intended to be focusing on the uh, code of conduct um, with Mr. McDermott. And the second part was the, uh, the team building exercise um, with a facilitator. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Count. Mayor, I think my, my point was we need far more than an hour with one person and an hour with another. Because let's be honest, if we're going to sit here and be honest, it's going to be personal. It's not going to be one and done. And why do it a half measure now? And why not fix what's broken now? I, I, I don't understand taking it a half measure. Okay, I've got uh, Councillor Councillor Cario, then Councillor Campbell. Well, uh, taking what Councillor Campbell said in the last discussion, we have to start somewhere. We have to start somewhere. But my question would be, uh, would this be a, a by Zoom or, in, or are we gonna wait till we can do it in person? And then the other question would be, I see in the financial implications 
uh, we've got five thousand dollars earmarked for this two hours i mean we five thousand dollars only buys us two hours uh I, it would seem like we've set aside enough money for a lot more than two hours so i agree that two hours might not be enough in in it might take 200 hours for our group but uh for um five thousand bucks we should get more than two hours could we have someone answer that uh, Mr. Dark, uh, are we able to get an answer on that number? Well, the the, the budget was intended to uh, and cover the uh, facilitation up to five thousand for for both facilitators. So um, it uh, it may be in fact less than that, but I don't have a um, I, I we don't have a, we don't have a quote from Mr. McDermott or the other facilitator at this point. I just wanted a. A budget we may not need the entire five thousand, but I just wanted to set a limit, basically, to uh, to go out and, and and find the facilitators. Okay, then just to follow up on that, I mean, an hour doesn't give us a whole lot of time with each person. I would think that we might want to do a bit more than an hour. I mean, I don't see what the difference would be if we did two or three hours. Um, I mean, it takes us four or five hours to do anything. So why not put in two or three hours on each one of these and see where we go. And if we need more, we go more. That's it. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Uh, Vince, thank you. Uh, you're right. We got to start someplace. And I think that as we move along, if what we're being instructed with and participating in leads to further requirements for further counseling we can make that motion as a group but we got to start someplace and I, 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 I'm, I'm in full support of the program and on the basis that we can make it further we can make more choices as we go along okay. thank you for that Councilor Lococo thank you Mr. Mayor I agree we need to start somewhere. I don't think a two hour session is something that will be of any value. It's great to go over the code of conduct um, as a refresher, that's great. Uh, a resident, Angela Peeble, she is on standby and she has come up with a fourth option called workplace restoration. And it's um, done by ADR Chambers, who is uh, the firm that Mr. McDermott is with. I would like to put a motion forward that we hear from Ms. Peebles about the research that she's done and listen to what she has to say about that program. I'll second I don't that. Think we, I don't think we need a motion for that. Mr. Clerk, do we need a motion for that? Because, yeah. Uh, at this point, uh, there is no motion needed for Ms. Peebles to speak. Uh, she went through the delegation process to be added to the agenda for a matter that is on the council agenda. So I believe she is standing by if council wishes to hear from her. Hey, Councillor Cario. Just a question, is uh, Peebles gonna speak on her idea on this or is she coming on to talk about the nasty email that she forwarded to all of us? Ms. Peebles. Peebles, whatever her name is, Peebles. Ms. Peebles. Whatever. Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do we know what the nature of the discussion is? with Ms. Peebles? Uh, Ms. Peebles has the, uh, the, the right, I suppose, to speak to the matter that is on the agenda. So that is the HR report uh, dealing with the council training. And I, I should preface uh, before she speaks that that is what she should limit her comments to. Um, and like every other public speaker that we've had here, uh, recently, that limit would be to five minutes. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Peebles, are you there? Yes, I'm here, thank you. Okay, thank you, welcome to the call. And you've got five minutes to speak to the item on the agenda. Thank you. Um, I was going to read a portion of the email that I sent to city council. Um, but I don't yeah, think I'll bother with that right now. Um, yeah. I think that Councillor Cario, uh, just by the way that he addressed me prior to this, uh, to um, allowing me to speak, 
couldn't even use my first name or address me by any other um, way than Peebles, um, really, really clarifies uh, everything that I was trying to outline in my email to council today. So I'm going to skip all of the, the things that I pointed out um, with the negative behavior and uh, just go right on to what I wanted to present to you tonight. And I agree with Councillor um, Iannone and Councillor Lococo and many of the other councillors who have said that um, a two hour session is certainly not enough to fix the dysfunction that this council is exhibiting. And a perfect example of that, um, Councillor Cario just exhibited classic um we just heard councillor peter angelo say that um he knows that distance is present um and i don't think that um a one hour session on the code of conduct and a one hour session on team building would be nearly enough to erase that behavior that was just displayed so i did do some research into um options and uh, I hope that you had a chance to read the email. Um, the fourth option for you to consider tonight, uh, I have done some research on how to best repair broken relationships and improper behaviors in the workplace. And I believe workplace restoration would be an excellent fit for council to engage in in order to repair the dysfunction. How it works is a consultant will come in and gather the data about the workplace environment through a number of methods, including interviews, questionnaires, and focus groups. And they will identify the workplace challenges. Then they will share their observations and recommendations with the client, and then they will work with the client to develop a restoration process. That would include things like mediation, conflict resolution, team building, e effective communication skills training, et cetera. This workplace res restoration process is geared directly to the client's need. ADR Chambers, which is one of the companies uh, HR suggested for using options one and three, offers this service. I sent you an overview of the uh, restoration uh, process as well as the response uh, that I got when I inquired about the cost. And I just wanted to actually add to um, what I had sent in the email is and and that is actually in the overview is that um, the first step is the is the workplace review. If it turns out that um, the workplace review doesn't find any any problems, then you don't have to move on to the restoration process. So basically, um, I'm just sort of suggesting that you um, take place in, in this workplace restoration pro process. And if it's found that there are no problems, then you don't actually have to continue on with it. So it's sort of like a two step process. So um, I do hear from all council me uh, members tonight or not from all of them, but those who have spoken that they agree that there is some sort of need for um, a process of some sort. And that's exactly what the workplace restoration process is um, exactly for. Okay, is that it? Yeah, I did. I manage okay. under five minutes. You did. You did. Wow, you amazing! In. I didn't have to get interrupted this time. Yeah, you got in. Thank you for that. Um, do we have any questions of the councillors? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Peebles. So, uh, council, there is a motion on the floor, a move by councillor. I'm sorry. Help me out. Move. Moved Peter, by Councillor Peter Angelo. Angelo. Okay, no, I'll thank second you. It. Seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. Is there any further discussion to that motion? Okay, well, yeah, oh, yep, yeah, I've got Councillor Cario and Councillor Coco. Thank you, Worship. The only thing is, I don't want to limit it to one hour per session. I think that it, yeah, an hour per session uh, with a two hour total is not enough. So um, I don't know why we'd have to limit it. I think that if we were in the middle of a discussion, I hate to have the guy watching her whoever it is doing it, watch the clock and say, well, you got five minutes left. So I think I think that we need to take a bit more. The, the motion is for one hour. Uh, I would think that it should be you know, maybe two or three hours per session, uh, two anyways, or, or whatever it takes. I, I, uh, I see there's a $5,000 budget, so I don't see why we have to tie it to one hour per session. 
So I'll go to the mover, uh, Councillor Pietrangelo. You're okay with uh, with uh, or that suggestion? Yeah, I'm fine with extending each one, uh, Your Worship. I also wanted to say, I mean, I'm not entirely opposed to the workplace restoration. I just think, like a lot of other people have said, that we need a starting point. And I don't think that the the option that's in the report of option C is a bad starting point. I mean, I, I can easily attach to the motion that, you know, council can council can decide after we do option three whether or not it wants to engage in the workplace restoration program. So uh, and I'm happy to add that to my motion. Okay, so motion okay, so that's amended. And the seconder, Councillor Dabrowski. You're good with that too, okay? So on the timing, okay? So anything else, Councillor Cario? No, okay, uh, Councillor Mr. Lococo? Mayor, can I, oh, sorry. Yeah, I've got Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was going to suggest since option four came up after the motion, I was hoping that the mover and the seconder would um, change the motion to include option four. That would be my suggestion. I, I will not support just the two hours. I think we need to do something else. I know people are saying that we can do others later and extend it. Uh, I, I would feel um, happier and safer with the, the workplace restoration that we have a professional that deals with this type of thing. We have been given a fourth option and I, I would support that option. So you're not gonna support the motion? Correct. Is that what you're saying? Okay, Correct. thank you. Councillor Iannone? So if I'm, if I'm through you, Mr. Mayor, if I'm hearing this right, Councillor Cario said we don't have to do two hours. We can open that day to a longer time. And quite frankly, $5,000 for two hours, that's good pay. I, that, I mean, that, that's a great job if you can get it. So are we going into to a tight two-hour session? I, you know, I, I'm, I'm finding this conversation really hard to have because it seemed when Councillor Lococo and I talked about how we feel not being part of this team, and we do not feel part of this team, and then felt um, that there was sexism and misogyny. We ended up in a, in a threat by a, a, a legal opinion, and then an integrity commissioner, and blah, 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 blah. None of the, we, nobody's asked, not one of you have asked us, how do we feel? Um, can you tell us why you felt like that? We're, we're just wrong. We're just wrong. It's going to be very hard for the two of us to go into a room with the seven of you and not feel like we're being pounded down. And just so you're clear, I messaged her first and asked if I could make these comments because somebody then turns to her and says, hey, Lori, back that up because that's not rude. Um, but she said, yes, I could. You're going to ask the two of us to go into a session with the seven of you who we feel are bullying and picking on us. Now, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm not comfortable with that. So how do you plan to make us comfortable with that? You don't have to like what I say in there. I don't have to like what you say, but we don't want to go in thinking it's seven against two. And be clear, gentlemen, that's how we feel right now. Councillor Dabrowski. Through you, Councillor Ainoni, you, you mentioned that this is going to get personal, which is I, I'm unclear and unsure as to why you would say something like that. Um, I'm a new councillor here on City Council, and Mr. Mayor, can I just I say something? Point of order: He's not he, a mediator. He's not a psychologist. He's asking, Councillor Ainoni, he's asking a question. Yeah. He has the floor right now. He didn't interrupt. He, he can ask. Talk. Yeah, but I'm Actually, not going to answer. Mayor, because it just starts the back and forth. He we didn't even ask you. Himself. He didn't even yeah. answer, ask the question. Oh, you can see the direction he's going. I can't. I, I, th I think part of this problem, and I'm not sure how many are really part of the problem, but I think it just spoke for itself and I'll just move on. If we can move on, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Campbell. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. You know what, if you look back on the way the votes have gone, I don't believe that this is a misogynist council. I have supported Carolyn. 
I've supported Lori many times, even in tonight I've supported you. But I take offense when you say to me that I'm misogynist. I'm sorry. I, that's, that's my impression. I was hoping we could get over this with these sessions. And we just made a motion, and we're trying to make a motion to move forward. And you're, re you're restricting that attempt to move forward. Mr. Mayor, misogyny. Yes, are, you, are you done, misogyny Councillor is, Campbell? Councillor Campbell, are you finished? I, I'm finished. Misogyny Councilor. is not supporting a vote, Mr. Mayor. Sexism is not supporting a vote. I support votes with you guys because I think it's right, not so I can get a partial win. I support a vote because I think something's right. That has nothing to do with the article. It had nothing to do with, with what any of the females in that article, by the way, it wasn't just the two of us. It was female politicians across the entire region. And you are just showing right here. You don't have an, any clue on what we were saying. Okay. Do we have any other comments of any other councillors? Councillor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Um, I guess the first thing I want to say is uh, I don't want anyone to feel that way. I don't want anyone to feel that they they can't convene in a room, um, you know, and 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 talk about things. Um, there's an old adage that says that every every long journey begins with one single step, and that's really what's got to happen, Your Worship. It's that first single step. And uh, I mean, you may not agree with, you know, the, the, the option or the motion that's on the floor, but in some way fa or fashion, we all have to get together. We all have to be committed to doing it, Your Worship. So I put the motion on the floor because I, I'd, I'd like to say first, I'm committed to doing it. And I hope that everyone actually will be Your Worship. It's fine. Thank you. Councillor Dabrowski? Yeah, and I'll continue to second it. And if we could just keep positive and keep on track, that'd be great. And Councillor Ianoni, if there was any indication of bullying, I, I'll be quite honest with you. I think that's what cyberbullying was, and that's what you just produced when you spoke to me. And I didn't feel like I could speak um, my mind or how I felt, but that's the way I feel. And just ask for you know respect back and forth because I don't feel that I've ever spoken to you that way in two and a half years. Mr. Mayor, I'd be happy to send his emails back to him and he can reconsider that. Okay, let's uh, folks, you know, we're trying to move the ball forward and we all, we have to put our egos in our back pockets and we have to really focus on moving forward. If not, we're, things are going to be the way they've always been. That's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. So I'm very supportive of this option three with the expanded time. I think, as Councillor Pierangelo said, it's, it's the beginning. It's the first step in a journey. And you don't get to where you're going overnight. It's a journey. And I'm hoping we can all go along on this journey because none of us are without fault on either sides of the issue. We all have our piece that we played in this. So let's just forget about what's gone wrong and let's figure out how we can move the ball forward. That's what I'm hoping everybody will do. And from there, we can decide the next step. I think it's a good first step. Uh, I've got Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I've reconsidered. I, I will support the motion. I don't think it's enough. I think it's a small token and I think we could do a lot more. I would appreciate if we go through the two hours and we find that we need more, which I'm sure we will. I will support the motion because of that, because I do want to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, folks, let's call the vote then, please. All Your Worship, I just wanted to mention as well that there is another part to the motion that says that council can reconvene afterwards and consider the workplace restoration. Okay, so we've got the I motion. would second that. Well, we already made the motion, did we not? The, the motion is yes. on the floor. It's already He's seconded. amended it. No, I did before. I just wanted oh. to reiterate the amendment. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we've got the uh, we've got the motion. We've got the second. We'll call the vote. All those in favor. 
Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. It's a good first step. Thank you. Now, let's move on to another not contentious issue. Queen Street Promenade Proposal. Mr. Mayor, I have a conflict on this, but I did state it as 7.7 before the agenda got changed. It's really 7.8, so this is my conflict and I will remove myself. Okay, Mr. Clerk, made note of that. Thank you for that. Um, 7.8, uh, so this, let me just try to get it up here. Okay, so Queen Street Promenade Proposal. There are several recommendations and Councillor Dabrowski, you've got your hand up. And then I've got Councillor Inouye after that. Looked at the, yeah, thanks Mr. Mayor, through, um, looked at the staff report. And I think in speaking with the BIA this morning, I, I was able to speak with uh, the BIA chairman, Ron Cherbino. There seems to be a little bit of confusion within the report and what the BIA is asking for. So hoping we can defer the report. And actually, I'd like to make a motion that we have staff come back with the report. Basically, uh, it happened on Center Street. There was um, some challenges with the BIA and members of the street, um, some wanting the street open, some wanting the street closed. And obviously, by the emails that are included as part of this report, there, there's definitely um, those that are opposed to it. So hoping we can have staff maybe come back with a, a, a report that would outline different options, whether it be closing both sides of the street or closing one side of the street or not closing the street at all. But um, of course, the BIA wants to work towards installing these permanent closure gates, but uh, we need to give them some sort of answers and indication. I don't think with this report, uh, we have enough information to vote on whether or not a street closure would make sense. Obviously, there's those that are for it. There's those that are against it. But again, we'd like to see a report come back with two or three different options um, that staff feel would, would work well on Queen Street, whether, again, it would be a, a full closure, a partial closure, whatever the case may be, but maybe have staff work with the BIA on coming up with some alternative solutions um, for the potential street closure in the coming months. Okay, so in, in no deferral motion, uh, it's not debatable. We need to know the date you're asking for it to come back. Is that the next meeting or when's your- Next meeting's May 11th, 11th I think. Or... Mr. Mayor, I I'll, think that... I su I'll support the deferral, but I have a question that the okay. that should be in the report. Okay, no. oh, it's not, well, it hasn't been seconded yet. Okay. Um, I'll second it. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, we've got a motion, uh, Mr. Clerk, for deferral. Okay. To come back to the at the next meeting. Sorry, I, th I think you were asking that originally. Originally, I was to on the next one, meeting on, on one, and then uh, Councillor can send her question into staff. Maybe maybe is the best way to do it. Um, so we got a motion. Mr. Mayor, can I just say my question isn't for staff. My question, like I think, we if can't we can't even talk, talk about it. It's not debatable. Oh. Council. Sorry, I apologize. I understand. Okay, so motion for for deferral to the next meeting uh, to refer it to staff. Okay, for report back at the 11th, May, uh, March, uh, May 11th meeting. May 11th. May 11th with, with three or four options on, on how uh, various road closures could and might work on Queen Street. Okay, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Okay, Mr. Kirk, you got that? Thank you. Mr. Okay. Mayor, can I just say there was a bunch of people on on a list to speak. I didn't think they thought we would go for deferral. I think they should contact our staff because we heard a lot of conversation prior to this about making decisions without having all the financial information. And maybe they could provide to our staff their return on investments when the streets were closed. Okay, I'm just gonna ask our clerk if, uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, I, I saw jo Joe Merkai on the list. Yeah, I, I think he, he had emailed um, council earlier, but I'll let the clerk speak, sorry. Yes, we had one request to speak from uh, from uh, Joe Merkel from Daily Planet. Um, that's it. All right, make sure you can hear me. Uh, and he has withdrawn, so no one else had signed up to speak to this matter. Okay. Um, Okay, moving to uh, 7.9. Uh, we got to get Councillor Lococo back here. Can somebody text her? Okay, our uh, IT people are reaching out to her. Let her know to come back in. 
Okay, welcome back, Councilor Coco. We're on item 7.9, uh, Chippewa West Utility Easement, the recommend, recommendation of staff that- oh, no. uh, Okay, motion oh, by no. Councilor Thompson, seconded by Councilor Strange, that we move the two recommendations for the Bell Canada Easement. All those in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Item 710, um, where are we waiting? Here we go. Kayla Road, uh, waiting period for minor variance. Uh, I have a conflict, Your Worship. I have a conflict, Your Worship. Okay, conflict by Councillor Peter Angelo. Oh, Thank you for that. Move. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? All those in favor, please. Yep. Councillor Ainoni? Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, item 711 Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application. There's a recommendation uh, before council that the holding symbol um, be removed. Yes, be I'll removed. Sold. Thank you. I'll so move. Yeah. Okay. Moved by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Um, item 712 amended location of the electronic sign on uh, Thorold Stone Road. Councilor Thompson makes the motion. Councilor Strange. Um, um, I just want to say the staff were very uh, supportive about this. This wasn't about a sign. It was about the circle, um, uh, Thorold Stone Road and the circle at uh, Victorian Bridge. Uh, at all the signs have gone. gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, motion by Councilor Tom. Second by Councilor Strange. Strange. Did you want to say, say something? something? Yeah, I'll second it as well. I just want to thank Councilor Thompson and especially Larry Van for uh, accommodating um, the the family on uh, Thorlson Road to bring that back a couple hundred feet, which uh, appeased everyone. So thank you so much. Okay. And uh, the, Councilor Lacoco, you want to comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm happy that this all worked out and with staff and the neighbors. Um, I do have a question, though, for moving forward. Because this is um, 245 meters, which is less than the 300 meters, are we setting a precedent? Could this be used um, to get signs closer for next time? I was just wondering procedurally how that would work. Uh, Mr. Herlovich, do you think you could help us out on that question? Thank you, Worship. It's really going to be uh, adjudicated by council on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so we'd be looking at the circumstances. As the report points out, it's a rural area. The closest resident is even farther away than uh, the 245 meters. So there were a number of factors looked at. So I'm going to say it's not necessarily precedent setting. Okay, is that good, Councillor? Okay, yes, thank, thank you. you. Yes, Councillor Thompson. Um, I just uh, did a lot of investigation into this uh, situation, and these new uh, electronic billboards have less uh, impact than the old billboards that have all the lights uh, hanging over butt and uh, shining. Uh, and it bother people. This is looking at a television. It, they're very uh, professional. Anyway, that's good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Um, okay, item 7.13, Municipal Works Service Center renovations. There's four recommendations there for the completion of the renovations at the service center. Do we have a mover? You're muted, Councillor Peter Angel. Did you just say I motion for it? I said I'll move the recommendations. Okay. Moved by Councillor Peter Angel, seconded by Councillor Cario. Did you want to speak to a Councillor Cario? No. Okay. All right. Is if there's no speakers to the motion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Item seven point one four. Uh, Mil Niagara Military Museum lease and consent to subletting of the lease. So we've got Councillor Strange making the motion. Councillor Thompson? Yes? Uh, 
Do you want me to? Yeah, so Councillor Strange moved the recommendation. Did oh, you want to uh, second it? Yeah, uh, we're, we're including the uh, utilities for the city. Um, Was that the motion? I, let me just check. I think, um, I know, I believe the military museum people, since they don't pay rent, I think they're asking them to pay the utilities. Yes. Yep. They want the city to pay. They don't uh, have, they would have to close up. I told, heard from um, the uh, major guy there. He said, if we didn't have the city supporting us, uh, we would have to close up. This is a special facility and uh, I would include the um, utilities in the cost for the municipality. Okay, well, we've got the motion is the lease that they've agreed to, which in, they've got to pay the utility. So we're going to have to first, do we have a second for the motion? That's my first question that Councillor Strange made. Councillor Dabrowski. Okay, so we, we've got a motion. Did you want to speak to the motion? Myself? Yeah, yeah. did you want to speak to the motion? No. Nope. Nope. Okay, so I've, I've got, Thanks, um, I got no problem. I got Councillor Cario and Councillor Peter Angelo. Uh, did Mr. Todd have his hand up first, Jim, to answer oh, a question? I can't see him on my screen. I'm well, sorry. He, I think I'd rather hear him speak first. Oh, yeah, yeah, there he is. Yeah. I'm sorry. It doesn't show him. There he is. Okay. Yeah, uh, Mr. Todd. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think the reason why we're looking to the military group on the lease to look after utilities is that the second part of that motion is that we are agreeing to them subletting uh, the facility as well. And if you look at the attachment, there's uh, probably half a dozen other groups, albeit they're community groups, that will be using that facility as well. And our belief was that if we allowed them to be able to sublet, perhaps they rec could recoup and have those groups pay part of it. So you'd really have six or seven groups that, in our opinion, could certainly cover the cost of utilities at that building. Councillor Cario, does that? Yeah, I, I just, I thought that I, that council would like to hear that because this is going to be a discussion about whether or not we include the utilities or don't include the utilities. And I was going to ask, uh, how much are the utilities? Yeah, that's that's great. Maybe uh, we can ask, I don't know, would uh, Ms. Moldenhauer have that number or who would have that number? Hi, everyone. Yes, it, it's Kathy here. So through the mayor. The um, approximate cost for utilities for the armory are around $11,000. Water is approximately 1,000, hydro 4,000, and gas $6,000. So $22,000 a year in utilities. No, no sorry, the, the total is the 11. Oh, 11, 11 for everything. Oh, I 11 see. for I, everything. I see, gotcha, gotcha, okay. Okay, so who, um, okay, who just asked that question? I'm sorry. Uh, Councilor Peter Angelo or Cario? Okay. Yes, Your Worship, I just was asking the question. Is the motion on the floor, is there, is there a motion on the floor right now? Yes, there's a motion on the floor. The staff recommendation is that- And that's that, including utilities to, for them yeah, to pay the utilities. They got to pay the utilities and they're allowed to sublet to help recover that cost. Yeah, and I'd, I'd be afraid if we, we'd be setting a, a bad precedent if we, if we, uh, uh, got away from that's what all the other don't all the other people that we uh, lease to pay the utilities. I I think I don't Ms. Most Moldenhauer. Uh, Ms. Moldenhauer, do you want to weigh in? Hello again through the mayor. At at the present time, I will say approximately sixty percent of our groups that are renting city facilities do pay for utilities. We still have some groups that are not paying for utilities. But as we renew their agreement, we are including that condition within their agreement because we feel it is fair that all of the groups should be paying something towards the, the ongoing maintenance and the operating costs for their buildings that they're using free of charge. And I think that's the way we should go in the future, uh, Mr. Mayor. We're trying to help the groups. If they have a problem, they can come back. Um, and I thought when I saw the red uh, letter from Mr. Baldinelli, 
because it was a federal facility, I thought maybe he was bringing something to the table to help pay the utilities. But if, if not, then I think maybe we'll give him the opportunity to do that. All right, good. We'll uh, ask him if he wants to kick in. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I guess the first point I want to make is that it's a museum. I mean, a museum is not going to pay its own utilities. But the follow-up question to that is, if we're going to allow the Niagara Military Museum to sublet, do we know that they're actually getting revenue from the other groups? And if they are, how much are they, like how much can they possibly be getting? Are they even getting enough to cover the utilities? Do we know this information? We can ask uh, Ms. Moldenauer. Through the mayor, there are one to two of the groups that have stated they are willing to contribute towards the utilities, but not all of the groups can. And to answer your, your other question, Councillor Peter Angelo, I'm not sure about the exact amount that they can contribute. So at this point, I can't tell you if they'll be covering half or, or 25%. Thank you, uh, Your Worship. And just through you again, Ms. Moldenhauer, um, I, I, I thought we established that the Niagara Mil Military Museum has the right to sublet the museum to other groups. And I was wondering whether or not they're able to charge them rent and whether or not they're collecting uh, revenue from rent. Uh, if they are, I just was wondering how much they're collecting. Through to the mayor, up to this mm -hmm. point, they have not been collecting any money. And with the um, permission to sublet, we at this time do not know exactly how much they, they will be charging because they weren't permitted to do this in the past. You know, Your Worship, I hate to say it, but I think if we're going to... Um, move forward with the motion then we're only asking for failure i mean you can't get blood from a stone um you know if, if no group right now is contributing and no group right now is paying rent it sounds great to say that the negatory or the niagara military museum is allowed to sublet but if no one's actually paying rent then uh they're not getting any revenue in maybe we should go back to the table and come back with a solution that that, that we know the different parties are amenable to I'd, I'd like to see that, Your Worship. I really do. I think, you know, I don't want to make a hard decision tonight. Um, I'd rather go back to them and see and see what we can come up with. Especially a five-year decision. That's a, yeah. that's a long time. And that building, I don't know, we're going to have to have a look at facilities, what repairs it's going to need. Because every time we do something there, everything's at least six figures. It's not cheap, that flat roof and whatnot. I've got, okay, so I got Councillor Thompson and Campbell. Well... Everybody got the uh, letter from Jim Doherty, the president of the museum, and he and they've had other um, groups in there all the time. They don't they don't have a lot of money either, and uh, Doherty said, if we don't have the city paying the utilities that we will be closing that's what he said what's that mean sorry councillor campbell i would like to second uh, victor peter angelo's motion that we uh, send it back to staff and negotiate and come up with a better operating plan i go okay. okay. just to follow that up as well, Your Worship. I mean, I think if staff goes back and has that conversation with them and staff realize that there really is no money there, then we know the recommendation that they're going to be coming back with. So, but I think we need to know that. So are you oh. making a motion that make a motion for referral, Councillor Peter Angelo, or, yeah, or deferral to staff? For deferral, Your Worship, so that staff can go back and, and have some meaningful discussions with Mr. Doherty and perhaps some of the other organizations that are in there. Okay, motion by Councillor Pianos, second by Councillor Campbell. Um, there's, it's not debatable. Um, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's referred unanimously, or deferred, sorry. Um, all right, onto the consent agenda. 
Uh, what's the wish of council for the consent I'll, agenda? I'll move the consent agenda, Your Worship. Okay, moved by Councilor Pierangel, second by Councilor Dabrowski. And we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, moving down agenda to communications. Item 9.1, Town of Lincoln. Uh, support for McNally House uh, recommendations that we receive for information. So moved, Your Worship. Moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Strange. All those in favor? Okay. Councilor Inoni, you're good too. Yes, thank you. Mr. Uh, Mayor, I'm so I'm sorry. I, I approved the moving of the consent agenda. Was Mr. West Hughes's letter in the consent agenda? I'm or is not it, sure. No. I'm no, it's under it's it's coming up still? Uh must be, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, item 9.2, open letter to Ontario Recreation Facilities members, uh, recommendation for the information of council. Motion by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Thompson that we receive. All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Item 9.3, uh, uh, historic Drummondville BIA Move. budget. Move Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Strange that we approve the budget. All those in favor? Okay, Councillor Inoni, you're in too? Okay, that's unanimous. Item 9.4, thank you letter from Sleek Developments regarding Millennium Towns. Motion um, to receive, Your Worship. Motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange that we receive. All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Item 9.5. Um, Health Canada cannabis consultation open for comments. So, uh, yes, Councillor Lococo. Um, I was wondering when is our bylaw amendment coming to council? I've been talking with um, Mr. Hurlovich and he said he was looking through the amendments and I didn't hear a date. Do we know when that's coming back? I've had a lot of questions. Uh, Mr. Hurlovich, could can we get some help on on that? And there's also a letter. Later on, you'll see about a cannabis shop on Thorold Stone in Dorchester, a resident uh, upset. It's right within the vicinity of many churches and schools and kids. Um, Mr. Hurlovich, are you still around? Yes, I was waiting for a break. Oh, uh, sorry. I didn't see your, your, your smiling face. Yeah, it, because they stopped my video. I okay. Guess <laughs> I was detracting from the council members. <laughs> All right. Um, the floor is yours. The, um, so... Yeah, so I'm working with the consultants, but I don't have a date to bring that back. Um, the um, so, and that report doesn't deal with retail stores either. So that wasn't part of the mandate of that study. Uh, but we are working with them on the distance separations, largely which follow the uh, the industrial standards. So no, I don't have a date. I'll try and bring that back for June. Uh, as you pointed out, Mr. Mayor, a little earlier in this uh, meeting that the next meeting is three weeks away. I don't think I could have uh, a report ready for that meeting. Okay, Councillor Coco. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, the concern from some people is the growing season, that the further that we push it, J June, July, whether we're for it or against it, if we push it later, that's wiping out another growing season. So I, I would just like it to come sooner rather than later and that we decide what whatever way we're doing it. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. I, I appreciate what the councillor is saying. I will work towards that uh, early June date then. Thank you. Well, that's terrific. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Levich. Uh, so looking for a motion to receive and file. Motion by Councillor Cario, seconded by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Councillor Coke, or Ianoni, you with us on that too? In favor? Okay, thank you. Item 9.6, tourist exemption. I would so move the motion. I'll second the exemption. Motion, motion by Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, that Lowe's be allowed uh, holiday exemptions. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Item 9.7, uh, various regional correspondence recommendation to receive. Motion by Councillor Dabrowski, seconded by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous, thank you. 
Item 9.8, recognition of Doctor's Day and request Ooh, assurance. Day. Motion by Councillor Cario, seconded by Councillor Strange, that the city approve the request to turn colors on City Hall uh, and on the falls that day blue in recognition of Dr. Uh, Day. All those in favor? Your Worship, I just had a question. Yeah. Um, are we encouraging staff that are coming into the building to wear blue as well? Uh, that's a great idea. We should do that and maybe encourage everybody in the city that, oh, hold on, we're going to ask our clerk, Mr. Clerk. You might be wearing blue, right? It's a Saturday. Good point. So um, although Bill's been known to work seven days, uh, he's not confirming he'll be working that Saturday. But uh, regardless, it's a good idea. And he's suggesting that we do it on the Friday before, maybe. Where that's Friday a great idea. Before. Great yeah. idea. Yep. Yeah, that, that's great. Okay, excellent. So, And we already voted, so that was unanimous. So we're good on that. Excellent, thank you. We'll recognize all of our doctors. Item 9.9, .9, Monarch Ultra Run Across Ontario inspires... Move Councillor Strange be our representative. <laughs> He's muted. You're muted, Councillor Strange. I have no idea what you're saying. Uh, so, so, my, my so, knee, my knee. <laughs> oh, my knee, your knee. So the motion is for rec recommendations for information of council. Moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Strange, that we receive the information regarding the marathon. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Item 910, proclam proclamation April be a donor month, green shirt day for April. And the recommendation, City of Niagara Falls proclaim April 7th, National Green Shirt Day to help proclaim Be a Donor Month. So motion, motion. is it motion. for next year though? Um, is it for next year? Yeah, you know what? No, it's for this year, so it's passed. So I can speak to that. Okay, Mr. Clerk will speak. When that, when that proclamation request came in, the requesters did uh, were informed that it would be retroactive. They asked that we still go ahead and have the proclamation request, even though it is uh, passed. Okay, that's great, Your Worship. I'll move it. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Thompson, uh, that we approve the proclamation. All those in favor? Okay, unanimous. Thank you. Item 911, proclamation request, Medical Laboratory Week, being uh, the 11th to the 17th of April. So you missed this one again, Your Worship? Yeah, I was going to say, strike yeah. two. Okay, again, motion by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Strange, that we recognize that as well. All those in favor? Okay, it's approved. Item 912, proclamation request, Hiradenitis, Superativa Awareness Week, uh, that June 7th through 13th be that week in the city of Niagara Falls. Your Worship, I'll move the next four proclamations. How's that? Okay. Um, I'll second those. Okay, moved by, and I'll, and I'll just quickly touch on them for the viewers at home. But yeah, for sure. Moved by Councillor yep. Peter Angel, second by Councillor Dabrowski, that we approve the next four proclamations from 9-12 on. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. So that's that one I just said that I struggled to say. Also, also nine, 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 nine. why are we getting, why are we getting an echo? Is somebody, somebody, oh, there we go, thank you. Uh, proclamation request, National Public Works Week, which is May 16th through the 21st. Uh, proclamation greeting letter for Fallon Daffa Day University, uh, anniversary rather, and that's May the 13th. 2021 for Fallon Daffa Day and the proclamation request for Limb Loss and Limb Difference Awareness Month. And that is April as Limb Difference Awareness Month in Niagara Falls. So those are the ones we just approved. 9.16, Park it's in the park City, in the city com committee, committee motion, motion regarding additional signage on trails. Councillor Strange, you wanted to speak to this one? Yeah, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, myself and, and Councillor uh, Peter Andrew brought this motion to uh, the Park in the City and wanted to get it endorsed from them. Um, I don't know if everyone remembers, I brought a motion last year in February 
to do get some more education and uh, um, send um, what I sent to the health minister about Lyme disease and funding. Um, and then that came and obviously education at both school boards, but it came right before the pandemic. And obviously, um, you know, they've been having their hands full, you know, online, into school, offline, everything going in school and not school. So I thought I'd bring this to park in the city committee because we're in that time right now where um, ticks are, are starting to come out um, in our parks, our trails, our golf courses. Um, you know, you take your pets out and you bring you bring them home and, and um, you know, you can have two or three ticks and um, not sure if they're deer ticks or what kind of ticks they are. And um, I, about Lyme disease, and, and I told you last year about, I know about 10 people just in Niagara Falls that have Lyme, the, the effects and um, you don't get, you can't get treated here for it. You have to go to countries like Mexico or you go down to Florida um, or you got to go to Germany, which I know two people have gone there and paid over $60,000 out of pocket to get treatment there. Um, I just think it's, it's, it's that time again where people have to understand how to, the education part, obviously to remove these ticks, the way to, to remove them. Um, and if they get bit by one of these ticks and they're not sure what type of tick it is, they can bring that to public health. Or if they see that bullet mark red spot, they have only a limited time before they can go to the hospital and get um, uh, antibiotics, or they could be stuck with Lyme disease for a short period or a long period of time. And um, it's it's not an illness, um, which, you know, you look healthy on the outside, but the inside it's affecting all your your uh, organs and and it's 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 a real struggle for some of these people who are affected by Lyme and now you, you get kids who probably don't know what some of these ticks look like and they bring them home and their pets and they, they they're on the, the couch or sleeping in their bed and it could really get transferred to to a child which we don't want um, so I you know on our trails golf courses and this is the time when you're getting uh, you know uh, people doing their in their gardens right now um, I just want to get a some awareness and I brought this to the park and the city committee and I brought a few examples of signage that we can put on all our trails, um, at parks and municipal golf courses and just awareness to keep to the trails, not veer off them. And then maybe even have like a little, those barcode type thing on the signage that if they see a tech and they're not sure what it is, they just take a picture or they put on the barcode and it actually shows them exactly what these, type of ticks look like. And if they get bit by a tick, what precautions uh, they make or they, they may do, um, as well as, uh, I know there's other municipalities, I believe in Kingston, where they're actually uh, treating our parks and stuff for ticks um, with safe um, safe treatment. I, I, I think they use like natural stuff with garlic and stuff like that. And I, I would like to make a motion that we, um, we get staff to come back with some signage and put these up, and especially in the affected areas like Fireman's Park, Kathy Moldenhauer was really saying that there's a lot of ticks there right now. We don't want to fear monger and scare kids or people off trails and parks, but we just want to then become aware of what we have to do if you get bit by a tick or, the, or there's one that's on their, their, their pet or dog and, and the safety mechanism, how to take these ticks off. Um, because if you t take them off wrong, they're embedded in you, and then you can be infected with uh, with Lyme disease. So I'd like to just maybe re refer this to staff to come back with some designs, or even the Park and the City Committee, because they 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 we got some smart guys there who uh, who know about all this stuff with with Lyme and, and ticks, and we can attach it to all our municipal parks, uh, golf courses, and trails, and. Uh, and come back with a, with a report or something in, in the, to that effect that we can um, come back with something that's safe, like a barcode, and we can even benchmark off some other municipalities. But um, I think we, we're responsible, especially in Niagara area, because it's really, really, really bad this type of year, especially when you go to the trails. Me and, and Councilor Peter Angel go running, and, and for some reason, Peter Angel always comes back with a few on him. Um, I don't know because he's taller or bigger, but um, just to let runners, joggers know, and um, and to be safe and to be uh, aware and um, bring that piece of education um, where kids can check on that barcode on the sign and find out what type of tick they have on them. Well, you said the reason he gets them is because he's slower. 
That's what you yes. told me. Yeah. yeah. So they I'm catch up to him. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. I was going to talk, but uh, Mike did a great job in really addressing everything. Uh, the, the committee had the idea of putting the QR symbols uh, or putting the QR codes on the signs so that if there's anyone uh, out there and, you know, you need to um, search what a tick would look like or, or uh, how it's embedded in you or even where to go to get it removed, that you can just scan the QR code from your phone. Uh, much like we do when we enter city hall right now, you know, when we do our self, uh, when we do our self screening, those QR symbols are very, uh, are very handy because they give you instant information and they kind of take the anxiety away from actually searching for something. So I thought that was a novel idea that the committee came up with and I'm happy to support the motion. And, and, and my own experience, I know, cause I, I, live not far from Farmington's Park and I can tell you I know with uh, my dog before I got uh, the, the expensive treatment for him he one day would come back with 14 16 ticks on him usually under his ears around his neck under his arms and he'd jump on the kids beds and the ticks would hitch a ride and end up on the kids beds and that you do not want but once we started giving him this this treatment uh, you give him two pills a uh, summer never had a tick again uh, never, never. And, and, uh, um, and, and I, I highly recommend it to uh, anybody that has a pet to do that. And the other thing is that the tick has to be embedded for 48 hours before you're going to get Lyme. So the key is always go in pairs and check each other out. That's from Dr. Herji. Uh, yeah, I got you, counselor. Um, um, and uh, 48 hours. And uh, you check each other because they, there are certain places they always go and they encourage you to wear white so you can spot them because they're black see what they look like, and uh, you get them before they have a chance to embed. Because if you do, they're easy to remove. But once they dig in, yeah, you're right. You need a special mechanism to get them removed, and it's not nice. And uh, I've done many of them. And uh, anyway, anyway, you, you, you don't. And don't I'm the one that has to remove back. them from Councilor Peter Angel all the time after the run. So it's not pretty. No, no I can I imagine. imagine. <laughs> so anyway, uh, move along, Councilor Iannone. Just on the tick issue, Having black dogs is almost impossible to find them. But at dog training last night, there was a tick on one of their dogs and they said, get a roller. You know the how we do our clothes? When you get home from the park, just get that automatic roller and roll it off. They haven't had time to embed it yet. And the ticks come off on the plastic, on the gluey part. It worked. I didn't find any, but I'm, that's what I'm doing with my dogs and the expensive stuff. Yeah. That, I find that expensive stuff works perfectly. The oil on the neck didn't work very good, but the, that, the pill twice a summer worked really worked good. Really good. Uh, I'm part of that motion, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to if, uh, maybe um, get senior staff or Eric Nickel to maybe look at some effective ways that, uh, you know, Fireman's Park or whatever parks that, that uh, you maybe mentioned that have a lot of ticks so we can get some, some treatment for them. I know, like I said, Kingston did some with some garlic. And so where there are some different natural ways that are not harmful for people and for animals, but kill ticks. So maybe uh, you can add to that motion as well. Okay. Okay. So, so Mr. Mr. Do we have that motion? Yeah. Okay. We got it. Okay. We're good. So he's got that added in. Uh, so that was moved again. I'm sorry that we've been talking so long. I, who you, you moved it. Councillor Strange seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. Okay. We'll call that vote. All those in favor. Regarding the signage and whatnot. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. Item 9.17, correspondence from Ken Westhues regarding Niagara Grandview Manor. Uh, recommendation that we refer this to staff. Uh, Councillor Iannone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, I'm, I'm glad he reminded of the, him, uh, Mr. Westhues reminded Council of, of this issue. So what happens when he has not resubmitted it now? Because his time is up. Um, they haven't resubmitted it. How much longer do we let him go? And um, is he still operating? Are we, in, are we enforcing that he's closed? Like he has got some good questions here, but I think the most important one is how long does he have to come back when we refer it? He hasn't met the time limit we set him now. Okay, uh, Mr. Herlovich. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I would say that if council wishes to, they could deny the application. If they feel that uh, he's had sufficient time. What I can say is that we did receive uh, a revised application in our office about two weeks ago, a week and a half ago. Um, there are some deficiencies in, in that application. So we have asked them to submit additional information, but uh, they did miss the deadline. Uh, we sent a letter to Mr. Pinter's, Mr. Pinter and his, um, his consultants uh, within three days of council's decision, told them to get a revised application in since they were the ones that asked for the deferral. And we told them that we needed that, um, that application in by the end of March in order to be able to make the April meeting. So they were aware of the deadline. Okay. Uh, Can I start on the floor? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so if, if two weeks ago he submitted a uh, revised application that did not meet the requirements, defi deficiencies, I'm not sure how you want me to word it, Alex, so that it's not, so that it's correct. But if it did not meet the guidelines that he's supposed to meet, I'd make a motion that we, that council deny the application. I don't know how many times he needs to have. Um, can we do, we don't have the application before us, uh, Mr. Clerk. I don't know how, like, how would we handle something like this? It's not well, on the agenda. Mr. Mayor. Yes. It's on, it's on the agenda via the letter from Ken Wisthouse, but Alex uh, just said that we can't actually, Mr. Hulovich just said that we can deny the application. I think we debated it that night for quite some time. We've debated this same application numerous, numerous times. He has had more leeway than most developers who come before us. Well, I, I'm just gonna ask for some clarity because I, and I can't remember now the dates. I don't recall the dates. I need to read the motion, but um, I just, I'm not comfortable making a denial on a fly without everything in front of us. Um, Mr. Clerk, do we, do you have any information in this regard? Um, I would actually reach back to uh, Mr. Herlovich to clarify when he says deny the application if he's referring to the previous application or the forthcoming application. Mr. Hulovich? So, Mr. Mayor, I, I guess what I'm saying is the only application the council had before it was the, uh, the one that was deferred in February. Um, the, um, you know, whether, whether or not council, whether or not council can <clears throat> deny it tonight i don't know that might be a, a legal mechanism or uh, item but um all i can say is we have received an application it's not complete we are working with with the applicant um, the counselor did ask whether or not he's still operating we had our uh, building official out there we had our file enforcement staff there are apparently only three rooms and the oldest portion of that property, which are habitable, all of the other rooms are under construction. So at the current moment, he is not operating. Uh, he has picked up an application for a license, but I don't believe that's been submitted either. Mr. Mayor, I'll, I will take back my motion and say, um, if he doesn't have it submitted in by our next council meeting, that staff supply us the original application and we can make a decision that night. <laughs> Okay. So, yes, I could add in. We would typically give 30 days notice to the residents that this would be coming back to council. And since the next meeting of council is three weeks from now, we wouldn't be able to give um, adequate notice to the uh, public in the area. I, I, that's where we're. So we legally can't do it under 30 days or we could do it and notify them. Uh, we, the, the planning act says 20 days. And since they revi revised the application, I think, you know, so if it was the exact same ap application, we could probably get away with less time. The planning act says 20 days, but since they've changed the application or in the process of changing it, I think we would want to give all the residents as much time as they could have in order to get their um, their um, concerns expressed. So how far, what is the next meeting after that? Um, I would defer to defer the, to the 
It's June 1st, I think. <clears throat> June 1st. June 1st. So, so um, I, my motion would be that we defer it to June 1st, and if his revised application isn't in, um, we denied the first application. Oh, no, we, we re revisit the first application. Okay. I would second that. Okay, so motion by Councillor Iannone, uh, seconded by Councillor Lococo. Councillor Campbell, you've had your hand up for quite a while. Thank you, Your Worship. I feel that this individual is playing us, playing mm -hmm. our planning department. I'm not going to support it no matter what mm -hmm. comes in. Uh, it, it's always been insufficient, and it gets to the point, becomes the thin edge of the wedge, and somehow things like this come back where council still is against it somehow staff supports it and we all know 99 percent of the things that go to lpat supported by staff are going to be successful i say we kill it right now sorry carolyn i was would have supported your original motion it needs to be dead right now and Wayne, I would have kept it. I just don't think it legally would have stood up. I just want yeah. to make sure that we do something that legally stands up and that he has yeah. no wiggle room out of that again. Well, let's talk to our solicitor right now. What can we do? Well, we can ask uh, Mr. Lustig if you're on the line. Yeah. Uh, can yeah. you hear me? Yep, we hear you. Okay. So I think procedural fairness would require you to hold a public meeting to turn it down. If this is a, I don't know exactly what the application is, but if it's a zoning application, there is a process under the planning act and you're supposed to act in a fair manner and you're supposed to be impartial in making the decision. In other words, you're not supposed to decide in advance of actually having the public meeting. So I would, if, if what I'm hearing is that there's a application that is coming forward, I would mm -hmm. suggest to you that you allow it to run the course under the planning act the notice and hold a public meeting and then make a decision on the basis of planning um principles okay that's helpful thank you um, i appreciate that uh, yes councillor campbell yes if that is indeed the way we have to go i don't want staff coming back recommending the application i want to make a decision on this as a council member and then let's let LPAT <coughs> deal with the situation. Uh, Mr. Herlovich, Mr. Herlovich, did you want to weigh in on that at all? I, I got the rest of you. I know everyone wants to talk. You'll have your chance. Uh, Mr. Herlovich, did you want to weigh in on that at all, that comment? Well, um, you know, council, you know, is always the, the decision maker. Um, our reports basically bring in the information from residents, from agencies, uh, from various departments as to whether or not uh, it can be supported, um, I guess, back to the solicitor's advice, and that is we shouldn't be making decisions tonight um, because it could be viewed as um, affecting whether or not we had a fair and impartial um, hearing when we finally get to a public meeting. Councillor uh, Campbell. Yes, but he hasn't lived up to any of the requests that we've imposed upon him. He keeps playing this game. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I, like, I, I, I'm tired of it. And is there anybody here <clears throat> on this council that wants to see this area in our city develop the way that he's trying to develop it? Okay, thank you. Councillor Thompson, you had your hand up. Yeah, I think this has been dragging on so long for a good reason. What he is attempting to do is not going to work. Um, we already passed our bylaw uh, for um, vacation rentals, Airbnbs, not in residential areas. That's what he has. So I don't how he's even going to come in with an application that the council could even think. And I think that this could really hurt us with LPAT, with our bylaw that's been appealed and has been two years. They're driving our 
by law enforcement people crazy uh, with all of these Airbnbs. And uh, this is something he can't solve. He's got to sell them and there'll be Airbnbs or something like that. Um, it isn't going to work. And it's hurting us all over the city. We got to react to it. Okay, uh, Vince, K Councilor Cario, I had you had your hand up earlier too. No, my question was answered. Thank you, Your Worship. Okay, Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think we've been more than patient and tried to work with the applicant um, procedurally and by law. If we have to wait until June first uh, in order to let people know what's going on, that's fine. I wish we could do something else. I guess my question is. Um, is there anything right now at this point that bylaw can be looking at if something is operating illegally? We, we've given chance after chance to the applicant and it, it, it seems like an application goes in, it's not sufficient, we, we delay it, so then that gives him a couple more months in order to run an illegal business. Um, we, we don't do this with other developers, we don't do this with other businesses. Uh, if you want to comply, we try to help you. Um, this applicant is not trying to help himself, we've tried to help them. And I, I guess my question is, can bylaw be prosecuting or fining for anything? Is there something illegal right now that's happening and should we send bylaw until the application comes? Uh, Mr. Hurlovich, do you have any insight uh, into that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, I can work with our bylaw enforcement staff. They have sent letters to Mr. Pinter, he doesn't own all of the buildings that are involved in this application. So we've sent letters to both Mr. Pinter and to the owners uh, requesting that they cease and desist. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the Grandview Manor Inn property itself is under construction. So there are only three rooms in there. Um, the inspector says that only three of those are habitable. He did not report whether or not people were living or occupying those units. Um, but the property is allowed to have um, the um, 12 rental properties in it anyway. So if only three out of the 12 are habitable, um, the thing that he wouldn't comply with is licensing. But again, you know, he wouldn't pass the inspections. So he wouldn't get the license. Um, the One of the other buildings is also under renovation. Um, and um, with respect to the other buildings, it's the same material that the inspector would have to gather that the various city solicitors have advised you on before, and that is we would have to catch them in the act, which means we would have to have someone stay there who would come to court and say that they paid money, that they stayed there, and the, uh, it's difficult to get somebody from out of town to actually provide that kind of testimony. Um, does he know that? Absolutely. Um, so, so that's it's difficult to get the conviction because what we need to demonstrate to the um, to the uh, justice of the peace. Okay. Thank you for that. Does that help, uh, Councillor Coco? Well, it answers my question, but it doesn't help the situation. <laughs> okay, do we have any other uh, speakers? Uh, Councillor Campbell. Yes, please tell me what the bylaw is with respect to Airbnbs in uh, residential areas. Not approved yet. I know. Yeah, so Mr. Hurlovich, are we at, we're waiting for the LPAT for that one, That's the appeal? That is correct. We have about 17 rental properties, 13 different bylaws that site specifically allow them throughout the city. But um, no, they're not allowed as of right across the board. Um, and that bylaw is uh, at LPAT. We're waiting for the decision. Uh, we've been working with the um, regional prosecutor on our licensing bylaw. We hope to bring that back. Um, it'll likely be the June meeting 
that we're bring, be bringing the licensing bylaw back. And we worded that so that we believe we have some good teeth in there so that that would be uh, easier to get a prosecution for anybody who is uh, operating without a license. Um, so, you know, we're taking a number of measures to try and be able to uh, take appropriate action. And as I say, so hope, hopefully we will have that before you in June. You know, Alex, the only problem I have with that, the, on the basis of the way this guy's dealt with things, is now he's got, what, two months in which to put things together. And he's going to say, well, you allowed me to go this far. How can you deny me the right to continue? We should deny the request. We should put a hold on any further development. Can we do that? Mr. Rovich? Well, we can, you know, we can follow up with, with you know, you know, so the next step would be to actually lay a charge. So the first step is to say, cease what you're doing. And then the next step would be to actually lay a charge. Well, let's do it. And so we have to have the charge that we would be um, charging him with, <laughs> i.e. you rented to person X on this day for this much money and we are going to be taking you to court and that person is going to come to court and testify. Um, because otherwise we're going to waste the regional prosecutor's um, time and lawyers' money in order to get that uh, to the courts without adequate um, demonstration of wrongdoing. Your Worship, I would rather have a legal opinion from our solicitor rather than a, an opinion on legal issues from our Okay, Mr. Herna. Herna. You're welcome to have that. <laughs> well, it's good. We've got the planning side, which is obviously very important. And maybe Mr. Lustig, if you just want to weigh in on it, and then let's call the vote. We've got a motion that's been seconded. We've kicked this one down the road enough. Let's vote. So Mr. Lustig, what would your recommendation be? So there are two parts to this. One is this application that I spoke of earlier, which is the, I take it as an application to rezone property. And I made, I made the comments that anybody can make an application. Um, and if they make an application, ultimately, it'll end up before the council and council can make its decision um, for or against the application. It gets planning advice on whether it makes sense from a planning standpoint, and then it makes a, a decision and the decision um, can be appealed either way. Um, so, but the other part of it is current violations. And I think that's what um, what Alex has been talking about. I irrespective of um, whether a person makes an application to change zoning, which winds its way eventually to the council for a decision, if the person who makes the application is currently uh, contravening bylaws, like the city's bylaw or the city's licensing bylaw, then um, charges can be laid. Um, what Alex has mentioned, and I don't know the particulars of this, but what he's mentioned is that there appears to be some difficulties in terms of getting sufficient evidence in order to A, lay the charges because they have to be sworn. Somebody has to swear that the event took place. Um, and then B, getting uh, evidence to a court that will result in a conviction. You can never be certain, of course, but um, you need to have evidence. So assuming for the moment that leaving aside the application to change things, that the person is violating currently um, the bylaw or bylaws, the charges can be laid if that's the case. And the, it requires sufficient evidence in order to A, lay the charge and B, prove it in court. But you know that's what bylaw enforcement does. They, they investigate they determine whether there's evidence and then ultimately if there is evidence they they lay a charge and ultimately the court hears the charge um, and the prosecutor tries to prove it on the basis of of the evidence uh, before the court well let's walk down that path i'm sick and tired of this guy playing games sorry okay so um I think everybody, senior staff, have heard the conversation. We've got a vote by Councillor Iannone, seconded by Councillor Lococo. 
Um, Mr. Clerk, could we just uh, maybe get that repeated? Because it's been a while since it was said. Yeah, the motion brought forward is that a new application be received by council uh, and be in place with a public meeting for the June 1st council meeting. And if it is not submitted in time to meet that June 1st meeting, that we revisit the latest application uh, that had previously appeared before council. Okay. Yes. Yes. Councillor Campbell. Yes. Mr. Hervich said the present request application is insufficient. He's already said that. How can we approve this moving forward if the application he's put in doesn't meet the present requirements? Like, sorry, I, I just can't believe that we're allowing him to move, take advantage, move forward. We need to take a step against him and shut everything down. Okay, well, I, th I think we heard that, that from Mr. Hrlovich, it doesn't look like he's in operation, he's under construction. So, I mean, for now, guys, we can just keep kicking this can down the road. I, well, I think- If if you read what <clears throat> Mr. Mr. Westerhoos has written, that's not the case. Well, I think our bylaw guys are gonna have to uh, obviously follow up and investigate. And I think we're gonna get, we're gonna hear back from staff. Maybe that should be the motion. Well. Um, but there is a motion on the floor. I yeah. understand. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, so let's call this vote. All those in favor. Uh, okay. Unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Good. No, 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 no. Oh, you I didn't vote. I'm sorry. Oh, I your hand's still hand up. Your hand. Okay. <laughs> Almost. You know, your hand's on the screen. You got to put your oh, hand is down. It, that was because I was trying to get your attention before. Mr. Mayor. No, it's not on the screen. It was. Can he not uh, make staff a motion? Removed it. Can he not make a motion now to have staff investigate whether it's yeah. operating? Well, you can do it. It's being done, but you can. Okay. You well, can then I make that. I, I'll make that motion that staff mm -hmm. investigate also and continue to keep track of it until our June first. I'm sorry. Was it June first meeting? Okay. I'll so motion that. by Councillor Inoni, second second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay. Thank you. Done. Okay, let's Thank you. move down the list. Thank you. Okay, item 9.18, downtown BIA CIP, recommendations that we refer to staff. So I have, a con I have a conflict. Okay, conflict by Councillor Lococo, motion by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor uh, Iannone that we refer to staff. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Unanimous with the conflict. Item 9.19, mm -hmm. letter I referred to earlier from Mr. Bicos regarding a cannabis store in an area with schools and churches. Um, recommendation that we refer this matter to staff. Your Worship, I would move the motion uh, for Mr. Beckus. Yes. yes. Yes, yeah. Um, I would move the motion, but I, 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 I believe the province is the one that has already decided um, that cannabis stores are legally allowed to operate in any commercial unit at Am I correct in that? I'm, I'm, I, I mean, perhaps through you to Mr. Hurlovich. And then if that is correct, because I believe the province is the one that decided that, does the city then have the right to impose anything that's stricter than that? Okay, why don't that, we ask? That would be my question. I mean, I would like to know whether or not we actually have the power to do something. Yeah, for before... Mr. Mr. Backus's letter, yes, okay. Right. Yes, uh, Mr. Hurlovich, uh, did you want to help us out there? Well, Mr. Mayor, my understanding is that uh, the same as uh, the, the council uh, just outlined that the province allows for these uh, stores and recognizes that excuse me recognizes them as commercial units okay okay I so can double, yeah. I can double check I can work with our city solicitor because I'm not the legal beagle on all <laughs> things cannabis so just to follow that up yes. then your worship um, uh, our municipalities allowed to impose a greater restriction than what the province allows. Mr. Levich, to your knowledge. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I'm not aware that they would be, but um, you know, when they began issuing these licenses, they were sending us notice and asking whether or not there was any 
um, zoning issues. There were, I would comment whether or not they were within so many meters of a school. Um, and they have stopped cir circulating those. So I no longer receive those notices. They just issue the licenses. And the next thing we learn is that the facility is opening. You good with that? Thanks, Your Worship. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Coco. Mr. Mayor, if I remember correctly, um, each municipality had a choice whether to have cannabis stores or to not have them. So once we said yes as a municipality, one could come in, a hundred could come in. We have no control. The only contr um, the only guideline that it was, it had to be in commercial uh, zoning. So once we said yes, we've lost all control. We said yes. That That's uh, all of the education that I've read, um, everything. I'm no expert either, but that's what I do remember. That yes put us on the hook for as many as they want to come in. Okay. Um, Mr. Hulvich, did you want to weigh in on that too? or? And then I got Councillor Strange oh, next. I had forgotten that, but I now with the councillor's reminder, that does sound correct. And I believe they actually uh, provided additional money for enforcement. We took the money. Okay. Thank you for that. Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I, and I think it's it's changed so much in the last couple of years where you, they, had, they had a lottery a few years ago and you couldn't even have a store unless you basically won the lottery. And I think we had one by uh, Niagara Square. And now they're just popping up. I think there's three or four on Queen Street now. So I think any, anyone's allowed now, but they keep changing the rules all the time. So, and, and maybe, so the, the recommendation is that we refer the letter to staff and then maybe we may end up wanting to send a letter to the province and suggest that they have some vetting process. I mean, like his letter says, how many schools and churches are right there? I mean, it, it, it talk about probably one of the worst spots in terms of kids. Anyway, um, so the motion, I'm sorry, did someone make the motion already? I'm, I'm spun around right now. Okay, Councillor Peter Angelo, it was seconded by Councillor Strange, was it? No? Yeah, okay. So we'll call the vote then. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. Um, and on to resolutions. So we have two resolutions. The first one is that um, we consent to a two-year exemption, an exemption of two-year waiting period. For I have a conflict committee. on that. Yep, yeah. committee of adjustment. Second. Moved by Councillor Thompson. And I heard second. Who said that? Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. <clears throat> and then the second, excuse me, resolution um, is that a sign um, change is, is it sign? Is minor in nature? Is that what it was? Change to the proposed sign by law is minor in nature, does not require further notice. So I uh, need a motion for the second. <clears throat> Councillor Cario, Councillor Dabrowski, all those in favor? Thank you for that. Uh, ratification of in camera, Mr. Clerk. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Uh, Council met earlier this afternoon uh, in camera to discuss uh, a few matters, namely uh, two offers to purchase, um, one being for 4500 Park Street and the other for an unop unopened road allowance between Beechwood Road, Thorough Town Line Road, and as well as Uppers Lane. Uh, there was a motion to deny uh, each of those offers. Uh, lastly, There was a motion made that uh, direction be given to staff to begin discussions with the library board chair, chief librarian, and the city CEO on a new memorandum of understanding to outline services and supports that the municipality agrees to provide to the public library board. I'll move the ratification, Your Worship. Moved by Councillor <clears throat> Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? Okay, and thank you, unanimous. And now the bylaws. First, second, and third, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo, uh, given the bylaws, the first, second, and third reading, second by Councillor uh, Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. New business. Okay, oh my God. Oh, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Okay, I'm going to start with Councillor Campbell, but I'm going to give my seat over 
to uh, Counselor Cariel. Counselor Cariel, I need to take a break for a few minutes. I have to go to another room. So would you please uh, chair the meeting? Absolutely. For the okay, don't bring your you. mic. Don't bring your mic with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, we have uh, Counselor Campbell first. You're muted, Wayne. You're muted. You're muted. You're still muted. You're muted. Do you want me to do mine until? No, I got it. I, I got it. Oh my God! I can't believe this. It's an IQ test. Oh, I'm failing like Thompson. Uh, I'm sure everybody's aware of uh, our bylaws regarding overnight parking. But something has really kept come to mind with this complaint I'm getting from uh, 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 Mrs. Manojlovic. And it's against provincial law for her ex-husband to change his driver's license to an address he doesn't reside at. He owns two cars to his children who live with the wife and they can't get an overnight parking pass because he doesn't live there. And it's a, a law from 30 years ago. And she goes on that she contacted uh, uh, Paul Brown the licensing department and the provincial licensing and it's against the law for him to do that to to to, to get an overnight parking pass so I want to refer this to staff and I, I'll, I'll forward this to staff but I, I know that others have been dealing with it it's just that we need to have a second thought on our overnight parking passes. Okay. So we'll move by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Thompson. Refer to staff. Uh, I, I, you I want to speak? speak? No yes. second. We no. need a second. Vic is no, second. I, I second. Oh, you I, second? I, yes. Second. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. And I just want to uh, say I have been dealing with this situation. Everybody got the same email from her. And uh, when you look into it, you find out that uh, they have to have the people names in the house on the on the cars. And I talked with Paul Brown today for uh, 20 minutes and uh, he said that's the, the law and the bylaw. And he finally said, uh, we'll give them a pass for one year um, to deal with this. But I told them I was going to bring it up on the council. I thank uh, Councillor Campbell for bringing it up because I backed up because he was going to give them a pass. But I think we should absolutely change the bylaw with that section in it. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. So I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Thompson. Vic, you wanna speak? I do, uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. Um, what I was gonna ask is, is, would that be the intent of the motion is to pass it on to staff uh, yes. and, and with the hopes of changing the bylaw yes. uh, so, yes. that, so that you don't have to reside at the residence in order to get an overnight parking pass. Okay, I'm supportive of that. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. I was going to bring this up too, but from a different aspect. Uh, years ago when houses were built, some of them weren't even built with driveways because people didn't have cars. Then they were built with driveways for one car. Reality today is people have three, four, five cars and not just about the parking permit and putting the name on it. I would like to see maybe an expansive digging into parking issues, 
with families that have three, four cars and what we can do because it's happening all over the city. And especially with COVID, people were working mm. from home. So not just the person's name, I would like to dig into it more and see what other communities are doing because it's, a, it's happening daily for a lot of families. What well, would you include that in the motion? Councilor Campbell and Thompson, sure, if they can we look at that as well? Okay, any other questions on the motion? All in favor? Carried unanimously. Uh, who else had new business? Uh, Mike Strange and Laurie. Yes, thank you uh, very much, future mayor. I mean, uh, Councillor Cario. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I know we've been getting in, in a, inundated with uh, a lot of emails uh, from uh, downtown residents um, about parking issues, um, especially we're having a, a affordable housing project there on, on our parking lot and they're losing some parking. I would just like to make a motion that we do a, a, a parking review um, downtown to try to find where we can put some more parking. I know Councillor Thompson mentioned the old uh, railway line, um, even possibly another another uh, floor in that uh, affordable housing unit where they can actually have some, any kind of options downtown that can give uh, some of these commercial restaurants and stuff like that, some different options where they can, where they can park. Okay, uh, Chris, are you seconding that? Uh, second by Councillor Dabrowski. Are there, is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Carried. And I just have another one. I just want to wish yep. uh, Colonel Hank Hankey a happy birthday because it's his birthday. And so Wayne Thompson, make sure you, you tell him that I wished him a happy birthday. Oh. Sir. He told me five times May, every day. May 5th. May, May 5th. 5th. Okay. Well, early. I'm coming then. Okay. Or you can come with the mayor and I. To his house and sing a happy birthday. Oh, to perfect! Him. I'll be there. <laughs> uh, next is Lori, uh, Councillor Lococo. New Thank business. You, Act Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. The other thing I wanted to discuss was online voting. I know um, many many municipalities are looking at online voting for the municipal elections, and we were looking at that before COVID even started, and now COVID that has pushed so many people online. They're doing everything from ordering their groceries to banking to communicating with their loved ones through Zoom or, 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 or whatever. I know that the clerk attended a session on online voting and I did speak with him and ask him if he could give us a briefing and maybe give us a little bit more information if we are looking at online voting for our next municipal election. Bill, are you there? Yes, uh, thank you through the chair. Um, yes, I think it's inevitable that online voting would be used in uh, not only Niagara Falls, but likely several municipalities across Ontario. Uh, in the 2018 election, there were 194 municipalities that used some form of online voting. That's out of 444. So we were approaching close to half of the municipalities. I see this as, as an additional tool, um, likely for you know, an extended advanced poll, at least, uh, if not also available on election day, we'd probably still be charged with the task of also having the traditional way of voting still on election day. But we would um, likely have this in addition, as the councillor had pointed out, with uh, the current state of the, the pandemic, who knows how long things will carry on, um, or even just how uh, comfortable voters would feel coming to vote uh, in person. So it certainly is something that we're, we're looking at. The Association of Municipalities and Treasurers of, of Ontario, AMCTO, uh, they've also recognized that a lot of municipalities would be looking towards this as well. And they'll be working with uh, municipalities to try and come up with um, alternatives for online voting. I do plan on attending the AMCTO conference later in June and uh, I, I currently sit on the organizing committee for that. And this will definitely be a topic that would be very well attended uh, at that uh, conference. So it is something that we're looking at. Uh, we'll be um, looking at implementing this hopefully by the end of the year, at least get some direction and come back to council uh, with some further information in hopes of getting this implemented in time, of course, for the 2022 municipal elections. 
Okay, uh, Councillor Coco, are you okay with that? Yes, thank you very much. That's all I had. Okay, uh, Councillor Peter Angelo. Uh, thanks, Your Acting Worship. I had a question. Um, I guess it would be to Mr. Matson. So last year, I had um, brought forward an idea to Council in regards to affordable housing uh, at the building on the corner of Armory and Victoria Avenue. And I have um, discovered some, uh, some land that the city actually owns inside the city of Niagara Falls. It's inside the urban boundary. And I want to have the opportunity to uh, present it to council. And I don't know whether or not it would be um, at a council meeting or whether it would be in camera. So that really would be my question is, um, you know, can I be placed on the agenda uh, next meeting to uh, share with council um, well, what I found? Okay. Uh, I, I I think, who do you need to talk to, Bill? I think so, yeah. Bill? And through the chair, through the chair, I, I suggest that uh, Councillor Peter Angelo, if you could just send me uh, any information that you have on this request, what we'll do is we'll view it, review it at our council review meeting, and once we get that information from you, we'll better be able to decide uh, what format that should come before council, whether it be in camera or here in an open session. Okay, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Vic, do you have anything else? No. Nope. Uh, anyone else have any other new business? Uh, Councillor Dabrowski. She's going to make a, a motion to adjourn, but I'm not sure if we, we should wait for the mayor or if the acting mayor. Oh, oh never mind. Not, I spoke not, too. Eating, eating. Uh, so then we could take a, a motion for adjournment by Councillor Dabrowski, second by Councillor Strange. Everyone's in favor, I'm sure. Good night, everyone. Good night, Carly guys. in Good night. Boston. Good night. Carly in Boston watching. Good night, Carly.